we talk to the legend of the creative and entertainment industries. Industries. We talk to those on the rise. On the rise. On the rise. Lance Dean Anthony Nielsen asks about the highs, the lows, and everything in between. This is Outcast Creative, and this is Industry Interviews. Thanks to Gary Bolter for that new swanky intro, which uh, I only got to use a couple of times in December. So, welcome back to the Industry interview section of the Outcast Creative channel, probably uh, the section of the channel that we are most well known for. It's uh, what makes us truly unique, I think. And um, I have been int interviewing people pretty much from day one since I took the channel in this direction. We started with our interview with uh, Jason Fleming uh, in the summer of uh, 2022. And that was in industry interview number one. We are now on Industry Interview 47, and we've got a fantastic guest uh, coming in today who has worked on some of my uh, most favourite films uh, from the 80s and 90s. But not only that, uh, quite a few of those films have quite a specific uh, memory for me. Uh, you know, several of them I saw on the opening night in London uh, in big, very big cinemas with a, a packed out uh, audience. Uh, uh, several of them I saw with um, my uh, parents um, uh, and um, got to take them uh, to see the opening night of uh, these films. Now, I've just realised I've just spelled my guest's name wrong on the scrolling text here, so I'm just going to correct that. I do apologise. We will, if that's wrong anywhere else, I'll get that, I'll get that fixed straight away. So first of all, I'm going to bring in my co-host, uh, whose job it was to uh, keep an eye on all things spelling-related for me. He's failed already. Uh, that's uh, Dark Hour. How's it going? I'm like the worst speller ever. You, I would not I would not ever put me in charge of that. I, that's your okay, own you're, fault. You're, you're, you're fired. He's out of here. Right, okay. Any <laughs> kidding? All right. So, How did you um, have it spelled? Hold on. How did you have it spelled? I'm just curious. No, it's I spelled Maguire wrong because it's, it's, it's Mac, M-A-C. -M did you have not M-C-C? No, it's M A C. But I'm saying, did you have it spelled the original? No, I missed the A. I missed the A oh, out. Okay, okay, I missed okay. the A out on the. Uh, I missed the A out on the scrolling text, not on the the main blurb. Okay, that's fine. Because I was going to so say, Dennis, if you put uh, M C G. That's actually a different Dennis McGuire who was like. Let's not it. let's not waste ten minutes talking about that. <laughs> so, um, Dennis has worked in the industry for a really long time. Uh, he's worked with some of my favorite directors as well as on some of my favorite films. Um, he started out um, uh, very early on, and uh, his father also worked in the industry. We're going to hear all about that from him. Uh, if you want to look up um, Dennis's uh, IMDB, uh, I'm going to drop that for people in the chat now. You can have a look through his credits, but we will uh, just put that up on the screen quickly before we uh, bring Dennis in, uh, so allowing him ch a chance to finish his McDonald's. So um, uh, you can, he's worked as a, a second unit or assistant director or first assistant director uh, on uh, 52 feature films and or television series. Uh, among the, the number include uh, Uncommon Valor, which is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, Blue Thunder, the television series, eight episodes of that. Karate Kid 2, which I went to see at the cinema with, with my very first girlfriend. Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Dream Warriors, Rambo 3, which was directed by my friend Peter McDonald, who was the second unit director on it originally. So we're, we're definitely going to touch on that one. And we interviewed Peter on the channel before. But YouTube banned that interview very annoyingly. But we will we'll try and get Peter back at some point. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade was the opening film of the Empire Leicester Square with its laser show. And it reopened after six months. I was there with 40 people. Uh, Black Rain, I also saw at the Empire, Leicester Square. Misery, I saw at the opening night of the Odeon, Leicester Square. Cuffs and Thunderheart, I both saw in the West End. Patriot Games, opening night, Empire, Leicester Square, screen one with my parents. Uh, and unfortunately, I also went to the cinema to see The Postman. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Rockstar, I saw on video. Uh, Rockstar has my friend Jason Fleming in it as well. And then there's a whole load of other uh credits uh in between these so quite the resume 
uh, not to be sniffed at. So without any further ado, here's the man himself. Let me take that down. Dennis, thank you very much for coming in. Oh, you're welcome, Lance. Uh, it's a real uh, honor to have you here. Now, I do this with all of my guests because I like to get a sense of kind of how you as a person growing up and, and uh, uh, indeed a bit later have been influenced by uh, the media and, and what kind of films and TV shows you like. So very quickly, no right or wrong answers. What was the first film you can remember that you saw at the cinema? Uh, Bye Bye Birdie at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Uh, most people know it as the home of the Rockettes. Yeah, you know, that would have been sort of that dance troupe that's been there for a hundred years. <laughs> would that have been in the sixties? Correct. Fantastic. Damn. That would have been what a great place to go to in that time. Last film you saw at the cinema. Uh, I paid for Oppenheimer, even though I've gotten a screener of it. Um, I just wanted oh. to see it on the big screen and I went and saw it on IMAX. And was that, uh, you're based in California now. Is that correct? Actually I'm in new Orleans. Oh, you're in New Orleans. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. IMAX. Very nice. Um, yeah. Can you tell me uh, which actor or actress um, <clears throat> that you ever worked with on set was the most biggest surprise? As in, um, perhaps they were unexpectedly charming or, or super easy to work with, and maybe you didn't expect that. Somebody who, uh, who really probably took it Harrison Ford. Um, right. Uh, I did call around a little bit to other AD friends uh, to yeah. get sort of feedback, but he was incredibly unpretentious. Uh, he actually went with my recommendation for security for himself during the filmmaking because we shot in London. Uh, we shot on the East Coast in and around Annapolis and, and that area, and then we shot in Los Angeles. This is for Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Correct. Oh, right. no, 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 actually, no, that was Patriot Games. Patriot Games, sorry, Patriot yeah. Games. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're going to, we're definitely going to come back to uh, uh, that film. It's interesting. Yeah. I have several friends who've worked with Harrison Ford, and none of them have had exactly the same experience. Some really good, oh. some really bad. Oh, um, interesting. But, yeah. No, I, I can honestly say not one harsh word, not one complaint throughout the whole shooting and um you know he was put through the ringer especially the end sequence yeah. where we shot in the b tank at paramount it's like it's a one acre uh tank exterior tank and it was five nights of cold well we'll, 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 we'll come back to patriot games okay. uh, yeah uh, we'll, we'll get to all that i'm just going to get no give you a couple of other quick questions okay Ready? a favorite film of yours maybe you've got it on dvd or even vhs that you always watch once a year without fail Probably, I try to get to Lawrence of Arabia uh, uh, at least once a year. I have the Blu-ray of that next door. Oh. Special anniversary uh, edition yeah. with all the restored whatnots. And, yeah. To um, me, that's that's just such epic filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. I got to see that at the cinema as well because it was yeah. re-released. I, 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 I did go too. I went into Century City in Los Angeles and saw it on the big screen just to uh yeah see it in the theater when it once again do you have a film uh that you might consider a guilty pleasure but one that you really enjoyed it might not be up there with the critics uh, choices um no i mean i I'm a, i like all kinds of films so i don't really have complete favorites where i have to say that's the best film of my you know, <laughs> enjoyment. Um, there's, you know, bridge. I'm on not talking about one you necessarily worked on. I'm oh, talking about something yeah. that you like watching. That you know, it might be a Chuck Norris movie or something that you you, uh, you, like, you love watching now and then. That m many people might consider it to be a guilty pleasure. You know. Yeah. No, I can't think of one in particular. I mean, I'll I'll watch a lot of films. You know, over and over again on TV if I can. Okay. All right. Well, I'll. I'll let you off that one. Russell, you got a guilty pleasure that you'll watch now and then? Um, hmm. Got to be Invasion USA for me, probably, I think. Uh, um, give me a minute to think about it. I'll, I'll pop back in with that. All right, yeah. okay. Do you have, last question uh, on this uh, round, Dennis. You're doing well on your points. Well done. Um, <laughs> do you have um, a favorite television drama series? Again, not something that you worked on, just something that you watched and you went, wow, 
this is good. This is this is groundbreaking. This is people are going to remember this one. Do you have one that sticks out for you? I could name quite a few myself. Yeah, there are quite a few. Ozark is the last one that I would Very say. Very good show. Very good show. Yeah, yeah. I was I, was, I didn't really know much about it and became a huge fan quickly. I just thought it ticked off a lot of great boxes. Right, okay. Hang on, I'm going to put you up the top here. Okay. Um, right, there we go. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, Ozark, fantastic. Mine would probably be, uh, if I had to pick an American one, it would probably be The Shield. Uh, oh, that's, yeah, yeah. Good choice. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's definitely my favorite cop show uh, of all time and, and in my top five TV shows of all time. All right, so let's um, start off. Tell us a bit about your background and your father. You obviously had a, from what what I, from our conversation so far, you obviously had a pretty strong connection with your dad, and he, it sounds like he had a big love of film. And I think yeah. through, through he was your segue into the business. Do you want to just give us a, a bit of your about your background and how you got started? Sure, sure. I, I was uh, born and raised till I was seven in New York, uh, mainly on Long Island. My father. Uh, worked in the business. Uh, his father worked in the business. Um, and so at a young age, I was taken to uh, Rome. My mother flew four children to Rome when my father was working on Cleopatra, one of the first go arounds until they shut down. And then we went back to New York. And he was, had a was very. That at, sorry, was that at Chinchitta Film Studios in Rome? Correct. Correct. Well, I've, been, I've been there. I've been yeah. there. Okay, so, sorry, please continue. Uh, you know, it was a, a, an amazing experience because we were there for about six months. So uh, my mom, you know, um, had four of us there. And uh, and then my father spent, you know, the bulk of his career, early career in New York. And he was he was uh, moved up from a prop master to an assistant director by a, a, an American director named Robert Aldrich. And at age 25, he was hired by Ely Kazan. Yeah, and he did on the waterfront, and at that time in New York, there was a separate assistant director sort of guild. I think it was called the Screen Direct Assistant Directors Guild or something in New York City. So when Kazan won the DGA Award, the Directors of America Guild Award, my father got the plaque for being the first AD. But there was a lot of grumbling. Uh, especially on the West Coast, because my father wasn't a member of the DGA, either in New York or uh, Los Angeles. But Robert Aldridge stood up in a meeting and said, the man did the job, the man gets the award. Right. So quickly after that, my grandfather gave my father the money to join the Directors Guild of America and uh, was a lifelong member. And um, he left... Uh, um, the uh, IA in New York and just continually worked as a, a an assistant director, then a UPM associate producer, producer. And then he was uh, vice president of Paramount for many, many years, about 10, 12 years. And then George Lucas stole him away and he was head of production at Lucasfilm and head of ILM for Lucas for uh, quite a few years. Um, Sorry, you, you, your dad was, was head of ILM? Yeah, they they had him. George wanted him overseeing ILM at the same time. He right. wanted ILM to be a little more film friendly to uh, other productions other than the big studio films. And so he felt that um, somebody in my father's position could wrangle other filmmakers to use ILM. Right. Damn. I mean, so you I mean, your father really... He, he he moved around a bit with some pretty big names of that um, era, including the people that were up and coming at that time as well. Yeah, he, he was working for, like I said, he did about a half a dozen Ely Kazan films as his assistant director or so. Well, back then when associate producer actually meant something. And yeah. then Robert Wise, um, Sidney Lamette, the guys like that. Yeah. And actually it was Robert Wise that brought my family to California. He, my father was his second year director and associate producer for Sand Pebbles. It was Steve right, McQueen. Yeah, yeah, Steve epic McQueen yeah. yeah. So once again, my mother packed up at that time, five of us and took us to Taiwan and Hong Kong for a year <clears throat> of filmmaking and then back to Los Angeles 
uh, to finish the film. They shot, uh, I don't know if you remember the film, but there was the big, big sequence in the engine room, especially. Yeah. That, that was an engine, a real working steam engine that my father found in Seattle, Washington, and moved to Cal down to Los Angeles to put it on stage at 20th Century Fox. So they had it on stage, not actually in, because the ship was built in Taipei, Taiwan. It was a complete replica of a gunship uh, on the Yangtze River in 1920s. Uh, and so uh, that actually even got moved from Taiwan to Hong Kong, even though it was a shallow draft uh, boat, it, it did make the journey across. So the strip how, did your, how did your parents, and I mean, I, I guess your mother, um, and we're talking about an era really when I suppose mothers were more kind of expected to stay home and manage the family. Yeah. You know, yeah. We are talking about a long yeah. time ago. How did she cope with the, the constant moving of the family to here to there? Is it well, was that something she stuck in her? She must have been quite an incredible woman. She um, kind of was because when she took us all five of us, the youngest was about 15, 18 months old. And we had to, back then you flew Los Angeles to Hawaii, change planes, Hawaii to Tokyo overnight, back to the airport, and then down to Taipei, Taiwan. And right. she was by herself you know, with five kids. The oldest was about, I think my brother was probably about 12 at the time. And I was probably about nine or something. And yeah, yeah. All by herself, you know. Did, and she, did your brother also work in the uh, industry as well? My oldest brother was a very successful prop master for many, right. many years. He's now retired. He's uh, a few years older than me, uh, three years older. And, uh, yeah. Um, he had a very, uh, successful career and, um, and then I had two younger brothers that sort of dabbled in it for a little bit and did not like it and got out and they've been successful in their endeavors ever since. Right. Fair, fair enough. So, I mean, that must've been a really exciting time as a kid. Your was it in, was it, in some ways, was it normalized? Cause it was, you were probably so used to it by the time you were a teenager. It, it was different and you know you were uh, you know you you just sort of got along you know and there was enough of us that we had our little nucleus and then yeah. you know, as a kid you're, it's easy to make friends at school well for some of us and so uh, you know my mom put us in schools and you just sort of got along so and uh we had, we did enjoy it it was different and exciting especially living in the orient for a year it was so different from anything at that era, you know, and yeah, and that's when we as kids, like even in Hong Kong, we lived on Kowloon, which is the mainland, but we knew the better toy stores were on the island of Hong Kong. So we knew how to get get to the harbor as kids, young kids, no adult supervision, get on the ferry, get across to Hong Kong, get either on buses or pay for taxis to get to the better toy stores. And then back again and back home without back any again with, with any adults with us. Yeah. Oh man, you must have picked up some uh, rare sort of items that were not available. Well, we did. Yeah. Of course, we had to leave ninety-five percent of it there um, to right. friends, and you know oh. we gave so much away because we accumulated so much too. And, yeah, um, I've got a. I mean, I've got some like <laughs> Japanese Hot Wheel Thunderbirds. Yeah things here you you, you can't yeah. get these in no. um these right. are imported you know and i've got i've yeah. got them relatively cheap at the time they're yeah. worth a yeah. fortune now but you go to japan you can get all kinds of stuff you can't yeah get over yeah. here so just just think of living like even in taiwan ten dollars of their money was 25 cents ours hong, wow. kong, hong kong was not as great a, a difference because the brits you know you guys owned it back then yeah. but it still was relatively easy for us to even if we only had a dollar you know you could still uh live high on the hog you know whether you were buying snacks or buying toys so your dad pr predominantly worked as a second and first ad that's correct well right? yes early in his career and then uh, and then production he, and producing and sort correct, of production yeah. management and that yeah so, so what what was it that steered you towards the We'll talk about some of your early credits in a sec. What, what, yeah. what was it that steered you towards the kind of the first AD career path? Well, having seen him on sets as, at a very young age um, was exciting and I enjoyed it. And so I kind of had an affinity and I loved going to movies. 
So right. when I was a senior in high school, I had a chance to to build sets on a movie called All the President's Men. Yeah. Uh, the construction coordinator was a friend of my father's, and uh, he was at Robert the house. Redford and, Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. So built the newsroom, was involved with building the newsroom, restaurant, interiors, uh apartment exterior all, lots of sets on that movie and that I was, newsroom set i mean look was really a, real yeah i was actually i was fortunate enough to be on set when the guys from the washington post all appeared in la and came to the set wow. so they were walking around with alan pakula the director and redford and hoffman and they literally went up there to their desk and said this is this is my debt this is perfect and they won the Academy Award for production design and set dressing because of that. You know, they did such a fantastic job of recreating the actual newsroom on stage. It, well, now it's Warner Brothers, but back then it was called the Burbank Studios. And so it was pretty, pretty amazing to see them that excited. You know, you, you, know, you knew them as as real rock stars in America. And then... Yeah. To, see these gentlemen not involved with the film industry get so excited about being on a movie set. They had, we hadn't started, they hadn't started filming in LA yet. They started in, in DC and then came back to LA. What, a, I mean, what a first um, movie to be working on. I mean, not only yeah. did yeah. you have two of the biggest stars oh. of the day, but you've also got character actor heavyweights like Jason Robards, yeah. Jack Warner and Martin Bolton. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll and see. Jack, Jack Warden yeah. was a family friend. So, uh, he and my father went back to New York days. And so when he uh, was in, he lived in Malibu for a time also, and uh, he'd come to the house often to visit. Wow. With dad and, and well, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'm just going to throw this question to you from someone watching whose okay. device is about to die. Uh, okay. He's not sure if you play any video games, but uh, do you have a favorite video game? Uh, believe it or not, even though I have two sons that are prolific gamers, as they say, I guess, I yeah. do not play video games. Do you play any kind of strategic games or board games, anything like that? No, play no, Monopoly? No. I, I grew, we grew up, you know, my era was the board games. And of course, Monopoly was a huge one. But right. I, I, I can honestly say I haven't played a board game in years, unfortunately. Oh, well, there you go, uh, CLS Studio. I, I, I took your question in before your phone dies. Yeah, you sorry. Are, you, were you on any of the shooting days for all the president's men or just, um, just, just well, you know, right. we'd get sent over as a prop maker. Occasionally you get sent over to help the grips fix something that it, they may not understand or like how to pull a wall. Um, but uh, I didn't really no, I wasn't able to just sort of hang out and watch the filming because, you know, we were, we were building the next set, you know, even when they yeah. were at the lot building, uh, and, and filming on stage, we were on a different soundstage finishing up the restaurant that they had to have built. The, <coughs> there was a big, long, I don't know, probably 40, 60 foot apartment front that was built for when they go and knock on a door. And, you know, wow. uh, I think it was when asking, they're trying to meet with Deep Throat or I can't remember exactly the scene. Yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to interview one of the witnesses. I think it's been, it's been about three yeah. years since I've watched the yeah. movie, but I absolutely love this film. Was there a yeah, sense it, that this film was going to be as big as it was, as it was being shot? You, you, you kind of knew it just because of the cast involved and the subject matter was so yeah. so big in America because it was such a, a huge event that happened. As, I mean, I mean, the movie was made in 76, so you're only talking, yeah. you know, four years after, or was it six years after events like Kent State and, and the Vietnam yeah. War, still very yeah. much yeah. in the public eye. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it was made in 75 and then released in 76, yeah. So you you started off as a, uh, I guess... You, a prop maker. A prop maker. Yeah, help, yeah that's, help the, I, that's the, the, the union term. But your your first, um, your first, uh, first AD work, uh, yeah. if we look at a couple of your early credits, better get cracking on those because we've got quite yeah. a few to get through. <laughs> And I know, I know Russ will have one or two questions as well. Um, but, but but if I can interrupt, so I made the jump yeah. in the early '80s on a film called Only When I Laugh. It was a Neil Simon movie with Marsha Mason and Christy McNichol and um, a couple other great actors. Anyways, um, so I, that, I I asked. Oh yeah, I'm, okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 1981. So I asked to interview as a set PA. 
because I knew the production manager, executive producer. And so uh, eventually he called me up to his office and uh, asked me why I was going to go from making quite a bit of money, uh, swinging a hammer, as they say, to working as a PA. And I said, I stood up and I bent over and made it look like I was swinging a hammer. And I said, well, Roger, when I'm 30 years old, I don't want to be doing this. And right. he said, I, okay, good point. So he, I got, I got hired as the set PA. And in fact, they took me to New York. We filmed in New York for about a month and then shot the rest of the movie in LA, built huge sets, built Joe Allen's, built Marsha Mason's <laughs> apartment, built uh, James uh, Coco's uh, apartment, I think it was, uh, and then built another apartment of, uh, what's her name, the other actress in the movie. Anyway, so we built through a writer's strike. Was it writers or SAG? I can't remember now. And um, so I, I was uh, I was building sets for 16 straight weeks until I switched over being a PA. And from, the, from there, I did my 400 days as a PA and petitioned the Directors Guild and got in as a second. And then did my 520 days and then moved up to first thing. Okay. So what was your uh, first job as a second AD? Um, uh, my first job was... Uh, I moved up on Racing with the Moon. I got right, in the okay. guild during uh, the making of Racing with the Moon. It was a Sean Penn movie. Yeah, Elizabeth another one. And yeah. Nicolas Cage, who we none of us knew. And then, of course, we found out he was actually a Coppola during the early stages of making the film. And he was, yeah, he was a bit out there. But I've run into him. Even then, of, even then, when he was that he young. Stole, was... He stole a lot of scenes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Did him and Chris Penn get on? Uh, I mean, uh, Sean Penn. Sean they Penn, did. Sorry. They did. Yeah, actually, no. they did. Yeah. Because Sean was quite the he was quite the hothead. He had he just was. done Bad Boys, and he was on the cover of Time. And actually, no. I had to shut him down one time. One night, we're filming, and and he was just being an ass, and um, and so I I I called him out on it, and he right. looked at me like you know I'm going to get you fired. And I said, you don't remember me. I go, your best friend on Point Doom was was a, the younger brother of one of my good friends. And right. so I said, you know, Dean Smith, his older brother, Craig, and I were best friends in Malibu. And so he, he, he switched over real quick. And from that point on, we got along. Uh, sometimes that's, that's, that's all it takes. Yeah. And I bumped into him since. And, you know, one night on Sunset Boulevard, we're filming. And it's like 3 a.m. and I hear my name called from the sidewalk and there's a massive crowd and I couldn't pick. So eventually I picked out, there was Sean Penn standing on the street corner. He had been at the Chateau Marmont. He woke up, saw a bunch of lights down the street and walked down to see what was going on. And we chatted. And then another time I saw him with his kid on third street promenade. And I was with my kid and the two of them were chasing pigeons and I looked over and it was Sean. And I realized, oh, the kid my kid is playing with is Sean's kid. So we sat on the curb for an hour and chatted and caught up and, yeah. So um, you, one of your first second assistant director gigs on second unit was um, Uncommon Valor. Yes. Uh, which I think that was partly shot in california and partly shot in in was it hawaii or Kaua Malaysia? on the island of Kauai? yeah it was that, seven, it. seven weeks on Kauai doing all that all the battle stuff and helicopter work and whatnot i had i i actually it was a, i was working for an older gentleman and the, the the jungle wasn't his forte so i basically was running a unit of 120 people a day for seven weeks on Kauai. right so um we shot we, in la also I was fortunate enough to um, interview Tim Thomason, who, of course, was, oh, was on that. Yeah, yeah. Guy. I mean, I, I he was one of the first actors I ever listed on my board of people I wanted to work with, and I, I just could tell from his energy he would be yeah. a lovely guy. And yeah, I, I can't tell you how uh, made up I was to actually get to speak to him for the first time, and also discover that he was as lovely as I always thought he would be, yeah. if yeah. not more so. You know, yeah. Nothing True. worse than kind of meeting one of your heroes and yeah. finding out that they're an absolute cockwomble. That that would have been yeah. that would have been absolutely tragic. Fortunately, Tim was not one of those. Um, yeah. and uh, Randall Tex Cobb was such a pain on that film 
and I had him on second unit. So the first time I was going to have him on second unit because first unit didn't want to shoot a sequence that he was involved with. And so right. uh, they, they, the first unit ADs were saying, what a pain. And you got to be there to get him out of his room. And I go, yeah, I can't do that. I got to be on the set. I'm actually running the, <laughs> the, the second unit. Um, and so I can't be in two places at once because the hotel was an hour away from where we shot in Luma High Valley. And so I went up to him. I went over to first unit the day before I was going to need him. And I introduced myself and I said, hey, listen, I, I can't be there to wake you up in the morning, but we really need you. I'll, I'll shoot you out right away. I'll get you back to the hotel. You know, you'll be at the hotel by lunch if you come on time and let us get you shot out. Right. Guess what? He showed up on time all by himself with a driver. Right. And was he done by lunch? He was. Uh, after, good, he, after he threw up in the Huey. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay. I, I know the scenes. I mean, there he is on screen right now. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so, what would you say the three most important qualities are that make up a good second AD or first? You know, what are the three... What are, I mean, I, there's a long list of skills you need, but what, yeah. are, what are the what are the most imp, three most important skills? Is actually uh, knowing what's going on, even as a second or a PA. As a PA, I always knew what was going on. I listened to the radio. If you hear what's going on, and, and a sound mixer helped teach me that. And uh, he was a great guy, Tommy Overton, terrific sound mixer in, in Hollywood for many years. So you got to know what's going on because – when you get asked something by either an actor or crew member, if you give them an answer right away and it's the right answer, you're trusted constantly. Right. And, you know, they know that, you know, what's going on. Even producers, you know, would come up to me at times, even as a PA and ask me what was going on. And as a key second, it's even more important. Uh, so I went from a, a key set PA to a key second, um, and that key second is the right hand of the first AD. So you right. definitely have to know what's happening at the moment, what's happening in an hour, what's happening the next day, in a week, in a month, you know, because you're you're the guy that gets everything done for the first AD. Because yeah. most first ADs stay by camera, stay by the director and the DP, because that's where things are going to change. Things are going to be talked about. So um, the second is more kind of running around and correct. You know, you're doing the call sheet. Oh, you're, yeah. You're solving the minutiae calls. problems. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're the advanced guy for the first AD because you're yeah. making sure everything after the, that shot and the next shot and the next day and the next hour, all that stuff is run. I, I always ran it through my key second because everything I knew he or she knew so they could do their job well. You know, did there's, you, you know, did you okay. shoot any of the stuff with uh, Alice Lau in the picture here? Uh, yes, yes, that was us on second unit, also because, um, uh, I nice lady, she, very nice. I lady. thought she was a phenomenal actress in this, yeah, um, yeah. And apparently, Tim told her she was a really big deal in Asia, yeah. And they, they they hopped over to Thailand at some point, I don't know. They did, the I film. didn't, I didn't, I didn't make the trip to Thailand, they went yeah. there as a small first unit even she went to she took them to some restaurant and like s suddenly they realized they were with the equivalent of you know thailand hollywood royalty and and and, yep. and like everyone in the restaurant parted like the red sea and and got up and bowed as she came in and stuff and i was thinking like wow and it, it's a shame she didn't go on to have a bigger uh career in hollywood yeah. but i guess she didn't need it because she was uh you know very yeah. big elsewhere big in japan as they say yes uh, yeah, and a nice woman. Um, how did you get? How did you find the rest of the cast on Uncommon Bella? They they were all great. I mean, Patrick Swayze was was known as Buddy Swayze then, you know, because nobody really knew him. Also, and so uh, he was. You called him Buddy. It was Buddy Swayze, not Patrick. And then after this movie, then of course his career really took off, and then he went to Pat, being known as Patrick Swayze. Right. And, um, it was tough conditions in, in Hawaii, um, just because you're in the jungle and you're, you know, it's like the grips uh, would have to lug a, a, a peewee dolly, you know, a quarter mile into the jungle. You know, not the easiest thing in the world when you're it's mud right. and it's raining and, you know, a lot of rain because we shot 
in an area known as the Blue Hole. It's like the highest recorded rainfall. Uh, it's like over 600 inches of rain a year on this island of Kauai. It's beautiful, of course. <clears throat> and the island has their own kind of jungle Grand Canyon. So I did a lot of flying. You know, I was always in the, either in the Huey or Jet Ranger queuing things and doing things and whatnot. Although I was the one, I drove the gunboat. Uh, there's an attack oh, yeah. of the gunboat, and that's me driving the gunboat. The one that shoots down Tim's um, yeah. helicopter. Yeah, yeah. No way. Because first unit needed so many stuntmen. We needed stuntmen. And you know, I told uh, the second unit director, uh, stuntman, Conrad Palmasano, I said, we can't stand around and wait for your guy. And, he, and so he finally copped to me that, he didn't have a guy that was a boat guy. And I go, what do you mean you don't have a boat guy? He goes, well, somebody to drive the gunship. I go, really? Out of all our, so I said, I grew up on boats. I go, I'll drive it. So I turned to wardrobe. I gave him my sizes and uh, Michael, very famous Academy Award winning Michael uh, Westmore gave me some dark makeup to uh, take down my shiny Irish face. And um, we shot the sequence. Yeah, because uh, Michael Westmore, of course, uh, very famously won a lot of awards for yeah, uh, Rocky won from Star yeah Trek. from Rocky yeah. I mean, the whole family are they're legends. I worked with uh, three of them. Uh, Michael <coughs> Westmore was like in every male actor's contract from Paul Newman to whoever. Michael, and then there was um, Wally Westmore. I worked with all three, and there's there's daughters and granddaughters now are famous. Yeah, he's got a whole. Yeah, it's, it's like Hans Zimmer. He's got a whole yeah. family of uh, people in his uh, <coughs> so, re required uh, yeah. skill set. I have actually written to Red Brown a couple of times to try yeah. and yeah. get nice. him on for an interview. Another guy that was just great to deal with. I mean, they were seriously, because a lot of times we had these guys on second unit, uh, yeah. although that doesn't really normally happen. But the nature of filming and first unit falling behind. And in fact, the, the first unit the original first unit cameraman got fired because of delays and, and whatnot. And, um, the studio wasn't happy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, there you go. Well, that's uncommon valor. Um, great soundtrack to that movie. And, uh, Gene. Hackman yeah. Is one of my, yeah. Yeah. One I got favorites. to, sh I got to shoot guns with John Milius. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, what's not, what's not to love. Yeah. So then you, um, you went on to work on, uh, I think it was the the Blue Thunder TV show. Is that right? right? Because of that, the helicopter coordinator, aerial coordinator, uh, famous Hollywood pilot, uh, Jimmy Gavin, uh, called me up and asked me to come on to this TV series. And I said, Jimmy, I've never done television. I don't. He goes, it's the same thing, cameras and, and, and lights. He goes, you'll be great. So it, I went over to do second unit and with a very short couple of weeks, uh, first unit was having issues. And so the production manager asked me to switch over to first unit for a week and a week right. turned into 12 episodes. So, right. okay. Yeah. I mean, which I guess was good for your resume. Well, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, you know, a, a, a quick learning curve on television, but it was great. Cause I like to work fast and, and uh, you know, you get, it was back then, you had to shoot those one hour episodes in seven days and either one or two days of second unit. Now they get anywhere between eight and 10 days to shoot one hour shows, which is right. mind boggling to me, but that's Hollywood. So they, they recast um, Roy Schneider as James yes. Barantino, who was not quite, a bad actor. Quite the cack. Yeah. He was, he was difficult. Oh know? Yeah. I don't think he really wanted the role. I think he needed the money personally. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, but that's when I met also Dana Carvey, who became a very successful yeah, comic on well. Saturday Night Live. And the crew loved Dana. He was just a great, great guy. And he's around my age. And so we hit it off and we used to laugh. And because every episode you would spend one day in the mock-up on stage on a gimbal. So right. he he was stuck in the helicopter with Farentino all day. Nah. <laughs> was no easy feat because he Farentino hated being in the mock-up all day long. Right. You know? So, but it was uh, the nature of shooting a, a film like that. It's funny because um, I actually saw 
the Blue Thunder TV series before I saw the movie. Oh, interesting. Yeah, wow. and I saw the movie later. Um, I didn't see it on its first um, cinema release. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if it was successful uh, in Hollywood. Uh, I did see it uh, myself. I liked it. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. I, I watched it um, about three months ago, actually, and it still holds oh, up pretty well. Okay. Yeah. And um, so the two actors in your picture, Bubba Smith was a very famous NFL football player and Dick Butkus. Yeah. And then I bumped into Dick Butkus a couple times at church because he liked going to, even though he lived in Pacific Palisades, he would come all the way to Malibu to go to church because he liked our Monsignor, John Sheridan, a terrific human being. And then I would I bumped into him once at a high school football game because his son went to the same high school and was a very successful linebacker for my high school in Los Angeles, Loyola High School. So I, I he was sitting close to me and I caught his eye and I went over and reintroduced myself to him. We chatted briefly. So I've got a question that's come in and someone's paid for a super chat, RRTNZ. Thank okay. you very much, buddy, for supporting the channel. Hey, all Lance and Russ, brilliant guest. Question for Dennis. What was oh. the most challenging project you've ever worked on besides keeping up with Chuck Norris? Because we know only Chuck Norris can keep up with Chuck Norris. Yeah. Um, no, actually, I, I've never worked with Chuck Norris, but the most challenging film would have been Avita because we shot in three countries, one unit, uh, 88 days. And um, I would have to change Madonna at least twice a day and there were occasions where we changed her three times a day in complete hair, makeup, wardrobe. And sure. mainly the, the hair wigs were, you know, um, not well, I don't know how, you know, they're they're difficult to deal with on women and men. So because of the seam and whatnot, but had a terrific makeup and hair team on that movie and Academy Award winners, both of them. Uh, Martin Samuel did all the wigs and hair for her. And then um um oh god um christy oh, i'm drawing her drawing a blank on the makeup uh that's all right but i mean I'm, we're jumping ahead a bit but as as, yeah. as he's asked the question now we'll we'll, yeah. we'll talk about avita now now you were yeah. the first ad on this one correct and you know, i did not know alan i actually got a call and it was a british accent and i thought it was a joke i thought it was a friend wind, as you guys say winding me up yeah and, and so uh sure enough an hour later there was a knock on my door and it was a messenger with a script called Avita. And I went, Oh, this is real. So I sat there and read it cover to cover within less than two hours. And then the next morning I got a call again from the same voice asking me if I read the script. I said, of course. And he said, would you be interested, interested in meeting Alan Parker? And I said, sure. And I thought, you know, Alan Parker's in LA, right? You know, cause the script showed up within an hour. No, no, no. He said, I will fly you on Saturday to London. It's like Thursday. And he said, pack for, for three days or pack for six months. I go, right. and I go, well, why? And he goes, well, if he likes you, you're staying. And you hit the ground running. Right. Because the first that they thought was going to do it ended up saying no to the film late in the game. So they were on a search. Okay. And I, I, that Yeah, because I... I it's unusual for Alan probably to um, on a project of this scale to work with the first he, he was not familiar with. I Correct. But I was highly recommended by somebody he respected who nice. had been a first for him and had been a, I, I think Bob had produced something for him also. Yeah. He produced uh, Mississippi burning for Alan. So he respected his, his uh, I guess, recommendation. So they flew me over. I met him at the Groucho club for lunch on Monday. Is that um, you in the background of that shot behind um, Alan's hand? Probably. Yeah. I, I think it is, so isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, um, so, uh, yeah, you um, met him at the Groucho club. Sorry. Yeah. And so we had lunch and then, uh, he, uh, he finally said, you know, uh, would you do this film for me? I said in a heartbeat, sir. Right. And so then I said to him, could I have that glass of wine after all? <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> he had offered me a, if I wanted a, a beer or a drink or something. And I said, no, I turned it down. And uh, so we were, on, we were through lunch by then. So uh, finally um, 
uh, David Wimbry, his producer, came and fetched us out of the Groucho Club uh, because it was we sat there through dinner, I think, almost. And so they go, you guys have to leave because you have to go to work tomorrow, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was so, it. You you were on that. For oh, yeah. Month. So, yeah, it was it was epic because we went through we had only one CGI meeting on that film and uh, it didn't go well. And Alan had never done any CGI work. And so after the meeting ended badly and quickly, um, I went to David Wimbry and said, listen, I know it's not, we can't shoot this movie on schedule if we do CGI work. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, well, look at all the crowd scenes. I go, I've done the checkerboard thing. He goes, the checkerboard thing. I go, yeah, when we move the crowd from here to over there to over there, you know, take after take, we've we've nicknamed it the checkerboard in america and he goes oh right. okay and he goes well i said give me the people and he goes really i go yes give it'll be faster and cheaper and it did i went through forty thousand man days of background extras in the movie and we shot the movie wow. on schedule you know it it did tax wardrobe and makeup and hair somewhat but it allowed alan to shoot the movie in a normal manner because we yeah. didn't do any of that stop and go. Uh, what David Macy asked earlier, and I'll, I'll put this question okay. now because it's relevant. There's so many stories and probably most of them are made up. So oh. how was Madonna uh, to work with on the subject of Madonna, working with Madonna? Well, I had worked with her and met her on Body of Evidence. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. I forgot so, about that. It, it, no, no, not one issue on Body of Evidence. Right. And so, uh, in fact... There was a courtroom sequence where she had probably eight to 10 pages of dialogue alone herself. And the first time we were in the courtroom, which was a set, we did a rehearsal and she kept going. So said it all from start to finish. Right. And we all looked at each other and went, oh, she came to play. Yeah. And all the other actors stepped up their game because she had all her dialogue completely memorized. memorized before we ever rolled camera. And so everybody was impressed. So that whole shoot, she and I and her assistant got along, you know, because right. I made sure she knew whether to work out in the morning um, because I could delay her or I said, I needed her first thing in the morning. So she, could she work out in the afternoon? So right. we, we shot in Portland, Oregon and Los Angeles. And then when she found out I was on Avita, it, by chance, my British second, Ian Stone was um, uh, telling me that they had just wrapped at this uh, recording studio and um, they were finishing up and blah, blah, blah. And so she was um, teasing Ian. And she said, like, who are you talking to on that phone? Is it your girlfriend or something? And he goes, no, no, it's my boss. And she goes, you're, I, mean, I could hear her in the background, your boss, who's your boss? And she goes, he goes, well, it's a, an American first AD, Dennis McGuire. And I could hear her scream, I know Dennis. So even on all of Evita, when especially when she found out she was pregnant and had to tell Alan and me, and the, right. the, through the schedule in a big turmoil because we ended yeah. up moving sequences up like dance sequences and all kinds of stuff up in the schedule, which created a nightmare for every department, including the art department. And we made it work. She rehearsed on her own with the the choreographer on the weekends and things. Um, and got we got it done. So I have the utmost respect for her. Now, in the music world, it's probably different, but I have two great film uh, experiences with her where she never threw a hissy fit. She never stormed off a set. She never yelled at any of my assistants or me. So I, I don't have anything bad to say about Madonna at all. I think that's wonderful to hear. And I, I mean, I think with Evita, she did surprise a lot of people. People weren't expecting her to be as good yeah. as she was in Evita, and um, she was. I thought, fantastic. I thought she did a fantastic job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go. Let, let we jumped ahead a bit there, so let's. Yeah, go I'm sorry. Back yeah. In, no, that's all right. It's just because the uh, super chat came in. We'll go okay. back in time a little bit. Uh, you worked on uh, Karate Kid Two. Yeah. You worked on Rambo Three, and Indiana Jones and Last Crusade. So these are three sequels um, of varying different degrees of success. Yeah. Uh, I think we can all say that Indiana Jones and Last Crusade, probably the best of those three. Um, yeah. uh, 
just want to touch on Karate Kid two uh, quickly. Uh, you were the you, you were the first on that, is that right? No, no, I was the key second on Karate Kid two. Uh, so, did you go to Okinawa, Okinawa, and shoot stuff, or no? We went to uh, the island of Oahu for Okinawa, ah. and we built oh, that, that doubled that doubled for Okinawa. Correct. So, oh, that was, that's destroyed my illusion of Karate Kid two. I thought they always went yeah. and shot it in um. No, Okinawa, no, I guess that shit. whole village was built from the ground up, except for the pond, of course. The pond is a very well-known Hawaiian sacred fishing pond. It was originally owned by one of the kings, and um, it's right on the on the coast, even uh, the North Shore. And um, yeah, it was a fantastic location. We actually had uh, the older George Bush visit us because he was friends with Jerry Weintraub. So he was on the way to China, believe it or not. And they were at a function the night before and Jerry invited him to visit the set. And he goes, well, I'm leaving tomorrow. And, but then he turned, uh, Mr. Bush, uh, president or no, he was vice president back then had the secret service arranged. So he would, he was supposed to be on the set for 45 minutes. Like the three helicopters flew in and landed in the parking lot. And then uh, he ended up spending two and a half hours. <laughs> right. So, it was, and I had a, I had to be with the head secret service guy the whole time. He said, you don't get more than five feet away, from, but I have to do my job because I don't care. <laughs> you stay well, next to me. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that's nuts. Now it's said by many people that uh, Ralph Macchio and the late great Pat Marita are two of the nicest guys you could work yep. with. True story. Yeah. True story. Ralph was a, a great guy to deal with. Never a problem. Pat was the sweet. In fact, Pat took me out to dinner a couple times in on Oahu. You know, he at the end of the day, he'd walk up to me. He goes, "You have dinner plans?" I go, "Well, no. Why?" He goes, "He didn't have his wife wasn't over." And uh, did you then go Buddha provide, and and would take you somewhere? Yeah, uh, great restaurants on the island. Yeah, and of course, the places we went to, you know, everybody knew him. That in the chef would come out, the owner of the restaurant would come out. You know, because he was a rock star. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, by this time, he was a um, household name. And it's funny when you think that actually none of the producers wanted him for the Karate yep. Kid film. Yep. Uh, he, think, he was a fantastic choice. Yeah. And then they also had to fight to keep his uh, scene that would get him. I think he either won an Oscar or got an Oscar nomination because of the scene where he talks about his wife who died in childbirth in yeah. a. Yeah. One of those ca those dreadful camps. Yeah, um, such a good scene. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad they didn't cut that out of the movie. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, yeah, any other stories from Karate Kid Two? Well, I, I I did a really bold move as a as a second assistant director on that. We were doing. The, if you remember the movie, there was the massive hurricane sequence. Ah, uh, yeah, know, with the kid o on Okinawa with the There's bell the tower. He has to save the kid. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sequence, there was an older Japanese actress carrying a real baby, you know, during the storm. And so we had a permit to go, you know, in, in into the night with the baby and the whole thing. And but eventually, you know, I got permission from the, the studio teacher and the parents to go a half hour over right. then another half hour. So finally, I, I said to the first AD, a very famous first AD, Cliff Coleman, he was Sam Peckinpah. Uh, assistant wow. director from the wild bunch all the way through like the getaway anyways so i finally uh grabbed the baby from the older woman and i turned to cliff coleman i said the, the first ad i said the baby's wrapped and john albertson the director overheard it and he says no 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 i'm not done and i just held up my hand and i go john the baby is wrapped now and he started to go off and i held up my hand i said john no the baby's going home now and i just turned around and i walked through the set over to the parents and the teacher i said i i thank you i'm sorry we went over um and uh we appreciate it type thing mm. and i went back to the set and jerry weintraub was even on the set and saw the whole thing so i thought i'm fired that night you know at rap i'll get told to you know pack my bags and i'm flying home nope never heard a word the operator, the camera operator on the film did come up to me later and thank me. He said, that was the best move I've ever seen on a movie set. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, John Abelson as a director, I, I sadly no longer with us now. What, no, what was he, like no, he as passed as a couple of years. Uh, yeah, very, very talented director. You know, I, I think I, I respect him. And I think he, you know, the first one and the second one speak for themselves. <laughs> They're great films, you know. And, yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, the a first, lot. The first two are the, the first two are the best. Yeah. 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 I, ju I just i just i just said in the oh. the private chat to you uh you asked me for my guilty pleasure film the third oh. karate kid is my guilty guilty ah. pleasure film because i think i think a guilty pleasure film is something that you perceive as not being particularly great but enjoy anyway yeah. uh the first one obviously a classic second one a very 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 good follow-up it was good yeah. it was it had it, obviously it's always hard following up a film like karate kid yeah. the yeah. third one does not even get close to the second one, no. but it's still one of those movies I enjoy. So yeah, yeah, I got asked to do it, but I was already firsting, so I turned down Cliff. I, I said, I you know, I, I don't think it's fair for you to have me drop back because I won't be happy. I've gotten the taste of firsting, and I, I just probably won't be as good as second AD anymore. Yeah. Did Ralph do this uh, stunt himself when he climbed up this thing and yeah, got the yeah. Kill? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All, 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 all that conscious. all that close-up stuff any wide stuff was no because why have the actor do it um, right but, but all his close-ups yeah he was a gamer i mean seriously he never complained once on the set ne nor pat you know they were just yeah, yeah they showed up did their thing um that actor danny was great really nice man uh yuji uh the bad the bad japanese guy kid yeah was a great great human being yeah, she was Tamlin was just a sweet, wonderful, yeah, young girl. I love the way they brought them all back for, um, uh, you know, Cobra, Cobra Kai. Kai. I yeah. was literally just about to say that. What does it yeah. What does it feel like to see the these cast members reuniting yeah. on Cobra Kai? Was what I was just going to ask. Yeah, you know, and and I think they all really got along. You know, I I don't think there was any issue. I, I you know I was around them every day you know and you usually hear gossip and they'll come up to especially a second ad and complain about something but yeah. no nobody ever complained on that film well that's uh nice to hear it's probably reflected yeah. to some degree in the well jerry uh, weintraub the runs a pretty, you know he ran a pretty good set you know and he he gave me a lot of work he was very kind to me you know he yeah. called me up i turned down uh the specialist and he personally called me back up and said, you can't turn me down, Dennis. And I said, I've worked with Stallone already. You know, life's too short type thing. Yeah. And he convinced me to to do the film over the phone. And I'm glad he did. Now, well, I mean, you worked on Rambo 3, which was yeah. a difficult production. I'm not going to um, dwell on this film no. for too long because I've already heard all the stories from... Yeah. And and I only did the U.S. portion, which was the final ending. So from the yeah, point that was the, the the battle they, 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 Yeah, for, so from the point where they pop up there, yeah. and see the Russians, that was all shot outside of Yuma, Arizona, yeah. in America. Yeah, because it, um, I think the that rest was five of the, weeks. The, Afga the Afghanistan stuff was shot in Israel, wasn't it? Well, yeah. the main portion of it, yeah. So yeah. when they get attacked at the end, and he drives the tank into the helicopter that was five weeks in yuma arizona to yeah shoot that, that whole sequence i was 1800 strong yeah we were spending uh, we were spending back then in i think what 1986 or something we so, were spending like two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a day yeah it was uh it was a crazy shoot now here's a question yeah. for you it's a um russell mccolke was the original director on rambo right. three he, he got he fired got, in israel yeah, he got fired in Israel about two weeks in because he was about he was already about two weeks behind. Correct. Um, and uh, Peter McDonald, who'd been second unit director on Rambo um, Two, yeah, uh, was basically brought in as Russell McCulke was being driven to his hotel to pack his bags. They called Peter in. Stallone was there. Mario Kazar. And Andrew, uh, Andrew uh, Vajna, Vajna, and yeah, uh, Andy, they, yeah. They Andy, said to him, Andy Vanya, yeah, Vanya, Vanya, right? Who's no longer with us, yeah. No, and I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get Mario to come and give me an interview. Actually, oh, that would be fantastic. It would, and he's produced some of my favorite movies, and I, yeah. I have written to him via Instagram, so we'll see. But um, 
they basically gave Peter, it was, it's a bit like one of those things where lawyers put you in a room and say, you've got to accept this deal now. It's not going to be on the table tomorrow. And they said, we want you to take over the main shoot. And he'd seen how hard Russell, uh, a time Russell had had. And he'd also seen that, you know, I think Stallone was kind of at the height of his ego. And I yeah. think Stallone, Stallone would himself, if you watch the recent documentary, he would probably reflect and say, yeah, you know, come on, I probably didn't behave the best. He tried no, to get no, we, we, chat, we chatted about it on on The Specialist. Right. And beca because of that, he actually uh, sat with Sharon Stone on her last day, riding back to the dock and told right. her basically the same story. You know, this is what you did to this whole crew. They hated you yeah. and you're not going to get work. And she right. did. So that's, that's interesting. So, um, and so Peter, uh, here's my question for you. Peter had to make a decision there and then. And he said, the reason, even though he knew it was going to be a nightmare, he said, the reason he accepted was because he knew if he didn't accept uh, all of his guys would have been fired. So yeah. would that have included you? You would not have no, got to. No, I on. was. I wasn't involved then. I got. I got called. Actually, I got called in Vancouver, Canada. I was finishing up a movie called The Experts, a John Travolta <laughs> movie, when he right. was sort of on the downturn back then. And so the U.S. production manager, who had been pretty much my mentor in Hollywood. I uh, said, I need you. And I go, what? And he goes, uh, this movie's coming from Israel to finish up. And I had done all the boards and schedules for Rambo 2 and then got asked to do the film. But then they had hired George Cosmatos, who was not DGA. So yeah. I decided not to do the film because, uh, you know, doing a non-DGA film uh, as a high profile uh, first assistant director. Um, I called my father and he said, listen, you'll get fine. You'll get on their shit list. Don't do it unless you really need the money. And, and I mean, I I've heard that George was not a fun director to work for. No, him. no. Yeah. I, I did do some pickup shots for a, a Bruce Willis film that he directed. Um, and he he's a, was a real jerk. Yeah, mm. terrible. Terrible director. All my friends on Cobra hated him, you know. And uh, yeah, I've yeah. heard nothing but bad stories about him. Yeah. And he, I, I every other speak. minute you'd hear him go, You, you're ruining my movie. Yeah, whenever yeah, I, you know he made yeah. a mistake, he'd blame it on some other crew member or something. Yeah, yeah. Charlie Sheen told me he paid his stunt double to bump him off on a film they were shooting in DC. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I hate, I, yeah, not to speak ill of the dead, but he was not a, a good guy, number one. And I, I don't think he was a talented director. I, I'm 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 sure there's a ton of uh, Charlie yeah. Sheen stories. This would be this would be the whole sequence you were involved in. Correct. Yeah. How many that. days uh, to shoot this sequence? It was five weeks. It wasn't days. It was five weeks. Five, five weeks to shoot this back this this battle yeah. scene. This end battle yeah. scene. There yeah. were times where I would not get off a horse. I'd get on a horse uh, before sunrise. I'd get I'd go through like three horses minimum a day. Because it was a massive dry riverbed and to get around with that many people, you know, it got to the point where I didn't even really talk to the effects guys because I had stakes made with flags on them. So I would ride out in the middle of the football field and place the stakes. And that's where they knew to put bombs and explosions. Right. You know, because it was just faster and easier just to do it myself. Then this, you know, yeah, because so you I, couldn't, I, you, you couldn't have a little go, a golf cart, could you? Because that, that well, work. probably back then we could have, but they weren't really popular yet. They like right. the, what we call gators, you know, by John gators. or, or that now that they makes them and other, yeah, brands they're good, they're good, yeah. So they, they became also. popular later, but this was in the 80s, so they weren't a real movie set thing yet, and uh, uh, so it's just easier to be on horseback and ride so, out. So was there a marked difference between um, the way Stallone interacted with the crew and the cast on Rambo 3 and and then the Stallone you met on The Specialist? Oh, most definitely. And I, I told him even, I said, you know what? Because of you, you made this film enjoyable for the crew uh, because we had our hands full with Sharon Stone. Uh, right. A little bit with Jimmy Woods until we butted heads, and then he realized I was correct with a, a SAG contract issue. 
And then right. Rod Steiger was a nightmare because he didn't like me because he, he remembered my father from On the Waterfront. Oh. And because he associated my father with Ely Kazan because he hated Kazan. Right. Uh, I know because your father and Kazan were good friends. So Correct. You yeah. know, he was kind of a, a grandfather figure. Both uh, Ely Kazan and Robert Wise were – like Robert Wise was at our house for birthdays, Christmases, Thanksgiving. I mean, he was – yeah, he was a grandfather. And uh, in fact, I said to my mother when I was young, I go, mom, we don't like going to those parties. And she goes, well, what do you mean? I go, well, we're the only kids there. And I go, it's great that he has movies for us to screen and we get to play on his pool table, which nobody got to play uh, uh, unless you were, you know, a movie star or something. Um, and sh she said to me, Mr. Wise wants you there. So you're going to be there. And so I, we, we all got it. It's like, no, we were like, his grandkids, even though he had a son, uh, Bob Wise also, that was in uh, a, cam a cameraman eventually. Um, I'm sure. not sure if Bob's actually alive anymore. I've lost contact with him. But anyways, yeah, we were we were the sort of the grandkids that he wanted to be around and he enjoyed coming out. In fact, he moved to Broad Beach from Santa Monica Beach because he liked being up at Trancas and seeing. And so he built a beautiful three-story home on Broad Beach from the ground up with his own screening room with miniature 35 millimeter projectors that you push the button and the pictures went up and you press the other button, the screen came down in his screening room. And that's where Malibu didn't have a movie theater when I grew up. So we used to go, Mr. Wise would call my dad and say, say, I'm going to bring home this movie Friday night, bring the kids down. Sure. So what, what was the, what, what were the biggest problems on, on the specialist? You got four, powerhouse actors there i mean it, it was mainly sharon sharon tried to get the director fired and jerry weintraub told her no eventually she gave up on that tried to get me fired and jerry said no and she just was not a happy person to be around and the crew didn't like her uh her staff her makeup hair wardrobe her assistant um yeah they didn't they were a weird little click and uh um, right they made it difficult. Rod Steiger made it difficult. Um, he was just not a pleasant human being. And you like know? like you said, Stallone kind of on the last day had a heart to heart with her and yeah. sort of said, yeah. Look, you're, you're kind of in your you're we you're yeah. where I was, you know, six, yeah. seven years ago when everything went to my head. Well, I mean, what was her reasoning for trying to fire the director just because she didn't like him or? Well, that's Jerry came up to me and asked me what's going on. And I go, what? And she, he said, why is Sharon unhappy? I go, Sharon's unhappy. I go, that's news to me. I go, he, she, he said, she want, he, she wants Lucho fired. I go, I go, we're on schedule. You're on budget. I know that all this. And he goes, yeah. So I can't figure out what, I think it was a power play. Right. You know, we treated her, you know, I didn't bring her in super early. I didn't have her sit around. I didn't even do that. In fact, uh, Sly went off to do Judge Dredd in London afterwards. And Tony Manafo, his started out as his friend and bodyguard and became a, an associate producer. He called me up from London and said, Dennis, he, he goes, they're not, they're bringing Sly in at seven in the morning and they don't work them until five in the afternoon. Why don't they do what you do? And I go, well, Tony, you should have put me in the contract. I, go, um, I, I actually was an extra on um, uh, Judge, Judge Dredd. Dredd. Yeah, yeah, I didn't uh, mind the movie. That was Danny Cannon, right? Danny Cannon. It was uh, shot yeah, he had Dredd, a bit of it? success, and then he shot himself in the <laughs> foot. Yeah, it had a lot of problems. There were, you know, the the yeah. producers thought it should be one type of film. Yeah, Stallone I, thought it should be a comedy. Everybody thought it should be yeah. RoboCop, and it it it, it, yeah. it was in the yeah. realms of RoboCop, but it needed to be its own thing and i really think that they should have trusted danny's vision for it and and i know yeah. he was very unhappy with it and the final script um uh was not uh what you got uh there was also yeah. loads of violence was cut out of the movie there's about yeah. 40 minutes of it missing and um, yeah you can see that when you watch the film well it's just it too, too many cooks you know that's what yeah. hollywood's yeah. problem is too many cooks <laughs> you know and uh there's, you know, the days of having real producers are long gone because now we get, yeah. I don't know, 12, 16, 18, 24 yeah. producers and they all have agendas because they're all hooked yeah. up. Some They're hooked up with certain people. So you have different factions that even hate each other. 
So yeah. they're all trying. They're all trying to, you know, subvert each other. Whatever. You know, it, it, that's being an assistant director on a movie set is you're being a psychiatrist for all these hundreds of people every day, trying to get the work done. Would you say that, <clears throat> you know, because you've worked in the industry for many decades, you've seen a lot yeah. of changes. Yes, including um, just the culture of the set, and yeah, you know. We never had intimacy uh, directors back in the day. Oh, no, that's, I mean, I did Body of Evidence and, you know, we had so many nude scenes and sex scenes in that. I don't, I, yeah, I don't know how that movie would be made today. Um, I, but, I mean, I want to pick up on the, the, the thing you just said about the producers because yeah. you're right in the sense that there was, that, that when some of the best movies in cinema history were made, it was the era of the moguls, you know? Yeah. It was the Eli. The one art. voice, the one voice yeah. vision producer with a director that they they gelled and they like Alan Parker had um, uh, your famous producer, um, David Putnam for years. David Putnam. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, David Lean even had Sam Spiegel, who, you know, my my mother hung up on 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 the waterfront because I don't know if you know that Sam Spiegel funded that movie for $800,000 because no studio would make it. Kazan wow. and Bud Schulberg got turned down by everybody in Hollywood. And they happened to butt, bump into Bud Schulberg their last night in Hollywood before they went back to New York City. And he said uh, late at night, coming out of the hotel room, because they were ended up being on the same floor and didn't even know it. And he was just going out because he was that type of producer <laughs> with two young girls on each arm. Um, and he said to them, we'll leave the script at the desk. I'll take a look at it. And then yeah. that's how that movie got made. So, I mean, do we, is it a case of in the current social and political climate, particularly within Hollywood and the studio system, that it, it, now everything seems to be done by committee. Yep. There's over discussion on everything. This is why, I think so many of the big IPs that have been produced recently, we could talk about Star Wars, but we won't, yeah. have turned out to be such a mess. Yeah. And um, you don't have one person leading the ship with, with a right. cohesive vision, uh, driving it forward. Like you say, with a producer to, to back them up. You've got 20 people fighting yeah. over probably every aspect in a, in a boardroom somewhere. And then all of a sudden you've got marketing people that have a huge voice because they'll dictate if they can market the film. Yeah. You know? um, and so it comes down to, I had a great conversation with a studio head who's no longer with us. Uh, we knew each other originally as prop makers. He was a very well uh, respected construction coordinator. And can I you, was a can prop you tell us, Can you tell us his name? Yeah, uh, um, it's uh, Gary Martin. And so Gary was at Columbia Pictures for three decades minimum, maybe going into four. He started out as Shell Schrager's sort of office kind of guy because Shell took him from a construction coordinator and brought him into a, a junior exec position. Shell retired. Shell Schrager told Columbia, you're nuts if you don't give the job to Gary. So Gary was there from the 80s all the way till he only retired less than five years ago. I think right before COVID he got out. And right. uh, so we were having a discussion and he, he, he and I, and I was talking about how it's not as fun. You know, you're dealing with so many entities and he goes, yeah, Dennis, the issue now is the wrong people are making the wrong decisions. Right. That's interesting. And re regarding green lighting films, you know? Yeah. And, um, the studio systems now, they're a small entity of these major Wall Street corporations. So in re reality, they seem like they're the biggest part of these massive conglomerates, but they're not. They're, they're a small percentage. So you've got corporate dictating things that know nothing about filmmaking. You know, yeah. even Gary once called me up when I was doing Little Nikita and said, hey, there's going to be a woman She's going to hang out on the set. Will you look after her? And I said, sure. Gave me the name. I didn't question who she was. I figured she was a VIP. So she came. My staff brought her. You know, she she was smart enough to ask to for me. And so she hung about for a couple of days. And she'd ask interesting questions. 
And then the third day she was no longer there. And so I called Gary up and, and uh, his assistant put me through. And I said, what happened to Mrs. So-and-so? And she goes, oh, she, she saw enough. And I go, oh, okay, I, I didn't know. Cause she didn't say she was not returning, you know? Mm. And, uh, and I said to him, can I ask who she was? And uh, I go, if, it, if I'm being nosy, I understand. So you don't have to tell me. And he goes, oh, that's Coca-Cola's efficiency expert. Oh my God. And I said, oh, now all her questions make sense. You know, she couldn't understand why Sidney Portier's makeup people didn't do River Phoenix's makeup. Right. Why, why the grips and electricians were sitting around be, when we were filming. And I said, well, they've lit the set, so they have nothing to do. And they got to kind of be quiet. So they all, you know, go sit down and be quiet, you know, until we need them again for another setup. So she was, you know, she was blown away by... I'm sure the inefficiency in her mind, but yeah. you know how a movie set works. Well, people are going to get upset if we don't talk about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Oh, so let's, okay. let, let's let's talk about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Okay. So, so that was well. another situation where they had filmed overseas in both London and yeah. in Jordan and other places. Uh, sure, if I remember correctly, I think they were even in Spain. So they yeah, it was back. Jordan because the King of Jordan lent them all the vehicles. Yeah, because he's so, got his own museum with all these yeah. tanks yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So I got called to uh, do the American portion with the train, the whole train sequence. So oh, that um, was with uh, River Phoenix. Correct. So we had River, even though it was second unit, and Mickey Moore, who had done the first two for for uh, uh, Stephen. So. We would we would go out and scout in Colorado and northern uh, New Mexico, and we scouted the train and and all that, and I, we videotaped it for him. So we went we'd go back to Universal where Stephen had his you know Amblin Entertainment, and we'd do these presentations. We'd put up the storyboards and adjust and say you know we can do this, we can do it this way, and and he just would sit there and eat his breakfast and go okay, great. And so we shot that whole tree, train sequence as a so-called second unit and the chase with the horse on river on horseback and the whole thing. And um, then Stephen came out, uh, David Wimbry, uh, not David, no, David Tomlin came over. and uh, Amazing he, first. Yeah, great. Legend. Worked on Bridge Too Far. Yeah. So I was there in, in the office telling him, okay, the, you know, showing him everything. And he goes, great, you'll do well. And I go, Oh, and it clicked. And I went, Oh, well, David, I don't, I don't stay. You, you have all my staff, my seconds and PAs, but I go away. And he goes, what do you mean you go away? I go, they're not keeping me. And he goes, what? And he goes, but you've done all that. Why? I don't know. It's, you know, and so he had a conversation and they didn't back down and, and uh, I flew home to LA and uh, he, and it turned out where my second, uh, who turned out to be a very successful first AD, artist Robinson, basically did everything. And David, you know, did, David didn't even ride the train for all the close ups, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and artist did it all. He goes, he'd call me. He goes, I'm exhausted. I'm doing. It. I have to do my job and be the first AD. And I go, well, relish in the experience because it'll be very helpful when you move up. Huh, huh. You know, did, he did, did a couple. Um, did yeah. this this train was this a working train, and how much it, of it did you have? We had for the big shots. We had all the box cars and whatnot. It's a narrow gauge um, uh, silver train that was uh, built uh, in the 1800s with the steam engine. I actually stoked the engine. You know, I got to drive it uh, one time and sure. and shovel the coal and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so yeah, we got to use it. It goes from uh, Alamosa, Colorado to Chama, New Mexico. And right. they have the period car box cars and, and, uh, you know, passenger vehicle. So it's a, a little bit of a tourist. I don't know if it still runs to this day, but it kind of occasionally ran as a tourist thing. How, how often were you stopping and starting the train in, in that? Uh, uh, well, a lot because, you know, yeah. you wanted certain sequences, you know, in a certain area. So you would shoot that and then back up, you know. So you and you, had, and you had a helicopter unit for that sequence as well, I think. They did, yeah, they yeah. did, but, uh, but not not for me, but for Steven, yes. Did so? 
I, I think I told you I took 40 people to the UK premiere yeah. of Indiana Jones and the uh, last crusade. I have the tickets in a, in a box right behind me. Um, Empire screen one amazing um, experience I, 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 laser I, I, show before the film that no one knew was even going to happen, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I was so blown away by the movie. I, I took my dad back to see it on the Saturday. I actually opened on a Wednesday evening and, and that day there was a train strike. So 40 of us in ball gowns and tuxedos in, in oh. five, you know, five cars with people yeah. in, in, in the hatchbacks and things yeah. crammed in all went up because yeah. we couldn't get up to London. So uh, and these tickets yeah. cost a fortune, you know, they were like eight yeah. pounds each. It was quite a lot of money back then. Um, oh, but I, we were blown away by the, the movie. Uh, yeah. did, did you go to the, pre did you get to go to the premiere or were you? No, uh, the, when they did, I forget where I was when it opened in LA. I didn't see it right away. Right. Uh, and I forget Nature of the job, it. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. It, 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 yeah I, the only real big one I ever got to go to was uh, Avita, Alan Parker. They they invited me, and it was a big opening in L.A. and and the whole thing. And we were all in in tuxedos, and and uh, there was a, cool. a a party afterwards for certain VIPs that I got asked. You know, I had a ticket for also. It's so Al, Alan was very kind so. to me. He did a yeah. he did a cartoon. <coughs> See the uh, posters for Evita and uh, Patriot yeah, Games. Yeah, I, just, I just noticed the, uh, yeah. the Patriot so, Games one. I'm not yeah. sure. You probably can't really see this. No, you let's, know, uh, we'll we'll, we'll enlarge you. Hold on a sec. Let's, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So Alan made that said, for you. Yeah, so Alan drew that for me and sent it to me. And it basically says something to the fact that you have um, – he says, we'll make. oh, it's me saying, we'll make it, Alan, we'll make it. And he goes – you have big shoulders, Dennis. Thank you for letting me lean on them from time to time. If the film works out, you should feel very, really proud. Thanks for everything, Alan Parker. And so it's that meant the world to me, you know. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah. Alan um, was the very much one of the guides and mentors for uh, two friends of mine. Uh, one of whom is Dexter Fletcher, who just made the offer, the drama series about the making of The Godfather. Oh, uh, for, yeah, yeah. For, for Paramount Plus and Dexter yeah. also directed Rocket Man, the um, Elton John biopic. And uh, him and his younger brother, Graham, who was my acting coach, um, they we all went to the same drama school, but at different times. Yeah. And did, um, did he tell you uh, how that The Godfather, when they screened it, you know, everybody knows when they first screened it, Paramount thought they had a, a, a you know, a big disaster. Yeah, you know, very expensive disaster. No, so, it was uh, it was the mob who actually spread yeah. the word. And so the editor on the film, Academy Award winning editor William Gold, uh, William um, Reynolds, was also a close family friend. He was at our house all the time for birthdays, Christmases, and whatnot. I don't think he, there was anybody of this era in Hollywood that wasn't at your house at some yeah. point. Yeah, so <laughs> he once. Um, uh, Coppola left the, the screening room. He grouped the execs together and said, let me cut the film. He, he goes, you have a great film here. Just right. give me time to show you. So without Coppola knowing, uh, Uncle Bill recut the film, which eventually, and then Coppola tweet, did his afterwards. But they all realized that, no, there is a great film. Yeah. But the first go around, the first sort of exec screening, yeah, it was a disaster. <laughs> That's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, and of course Al, he won, Al Ruddy he won the a, Academy Award for it, and then he he has a he had two uh, two different Academy Awards. But great guy, terrific human being. Well, that's always nice. That's always yeah. uh, nice to hear. Well, let's uh, let's move on. So I mean, among your other credits uh, yeah. to mention, but a few of them, there's there's Coupe de Ville, there's Misery. Oh, jo Joe Roth, yeah, Joe Roth yeah. directed that. I saw sure. Coupe de Ville at the cinema, and that's a movie that, like, most people never saw. Yeah. Uh, Patrick uh, Dempsey, who yeah. is now is in, in Ferrari and is a, a successful race car driver, with has his own Porsche team. Uh, Daniel Stern, who is a bit of a nightmare. And uh, Ari Gross, terrific actor. Should have – and I had worked with Ari on um, The Experts also. 
And, um, uh, Ari Gross was also directed by my friend Keith Gordon in a film called A Midnight Clear. Have you seen that? Yes, yes. And, and Ari is just, I, I, we occasionally check in with each other, um, not as often as I'd like. And I'd always thought of him for tons of movies um, with directors saying, you should you should give this guy a chance. He'll knock your, that role out of the park. Because yeah. I really respected his talent. Well, he looked like a young Dustin Hoffman, didn't he? Correct. There you um, go. And I don't know whether that hindered or helped him. You know? Right, right, yeah. yeah. Because uh, I'm guessing there must have been meetings where people said, yeah, he's really good, but he looks a bit like yeah. Dustin Hoffman. Can we get someone yeah. else? You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I, I, that's a yeah. shame. I mean, he's very good in yeah. Midnight Clear, which has a very young Ethan Hawke and Gary Sinise and Matt yeah. Dillon. Yeah, right. all, all of them, yeah. And we just lost Alan Arkin. How was he? Uh, oh, with? Just terrific human being. Just a nice gentleman, you know. And, uh, yeah, uh, just one of those guys, you know, uh, from that era that you go, wow, what a, you know, Sidney Portier, another great human being. I mean, fantastic human being. I just enjoyed working with him on Little Nikita. And, unfortunately, Daniel and, and Patrick Dempsey hated each other. And they ah. – the they didn't get along. So I, I'm not sure if a lot of it was method acting on Daniel's part or what, but they, I actually broke up a fight one time, fist fight. You know, wow. I had to run up to the car and pull them apart, physically pull them apart. You know? I need to, uh, actually, I need to do a special on this movie because a lot of people will not have seen this film. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's a, a nice, small film, you know. It's that it's, sort of coming of age yeah, Vietnam it, isn't like the Vietnam Wars looming on the horizon. And, yeah, and yeah. you know it, it. It was Alan Arkin's way of getting the brothers together. You know, under the pretext of driving Dad's car down to Florida to him. Yeah, yeah. Well, Daniel Stern is a. Uh, he, he, I think he produced the Wonder Years, didn't he? Well, um, he was the voiceover. Yeah. Uh, but he's now a uh, he's certainly now a producer and a director. Maybe again, you know, yeah. maybe over time I, yeah. people mellow. I, I've lost track of his career. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got I've got to watch um, Coop Deville. But would you say? I mean, that's quite a small film. Yes. Uh, oh, it that, was. Yeah, yeah. They, th these are not a listers at that time. They some of them are no. now. No. Um, sadly, of course, we just lost Alan Arkin. What a loss. Yeah. Um, would you say, because uh, this is certainly my experience, sometimes working on the small films is a lot more fun. They, they can be. And, and we say that about the small films and we definitely say that about second units because right. second units don't have all the, the hanger ons, you know, it's just, it, smaller units, you know, and you doing massive sequences and you know, you can do them. Um, without the big entourage, you know, the, all the people standing around, you know, mm. and people are blown away. Even when I did Rambo three and I was 1800 people strong a day, it was only two American second ADs and two PAs. And I was dressing, we were dressing 500 Marines in Yuma. There's a Marine base there mm. uh, every day as Russian Spetsnaz. So we had to dress them, get them an hour outside of Yuma onto the set uh, it was 250 reenactors dressed as Mujahideen every day, 50 stunt guys, 50 real Afghanis that we brought from LA that were pain in the asses because right. they they didn't get along because you had Sunnis and Shiites. Oh my so, god! Yeah. Okay. You know, and so once I found that out, I I had the producers ship them back, and they said, "Well, Stallone wants them." I go, "Well, Stallone can have them. He doesn't deal with them." I go, "We don't need them. He doesn't know they're even on the set." So ship them home. And he did. He never knew that we shipped right. them back because yeah, they were fought, constantly fighting in the motel. And um, my, my seconds were fed up with it. They're like, we can't handle this. We're going to quit. And so I well, just said, we don't need them, you know. And I would have argued with Stallone over it because we didn't need them. Anyways, then you have the actors. So and the crew, I, I mean, we were what, you know, Peter loved camera crews. So we had probably eight or 11 camera crew out there full time. Right. That's and he mix. had 36 Jeeps and military vehicles. Some were, were real Russian vehicles, even, that were located in L.A. and shipped to Yuma. 
and we had um, all the helicopters and a camera ship. You know, it was just yeah, it was every day was going to war. Uh, we got another question from RRTNZ here, and there's a comment from the wonderful oh. Wayne uh, Byrne, who of course writes amazing books about yeah. Water Hill and Hey um, Wayne. Yeah, we love Wayne. We love Wayne. Good to see you, Wayne. Thanks for tuning in. Um, RRTNZ sent me another super chat. It's really captivating guess when the stories are so good that Russ stays quiet. Oh. Uh, I mean, we're, we're well, here to let Dennis do all the talking, so that's yeah. the whole point of well, having a great guest. Um, yeah. Question, well, no. your, yeah. what was your favourite? So here's this question. What's your okay. favourite film that you've worked on and your least favourite? It's a. It would be between either Patriot Games and Evita. Evita because it was so big and epic every day. You, uh, sorry, is that is this on the favorite category? I'm, I'm sorry, favorite, yeah. Favorite. And, and also Patriot Games because it was the one and only time I got to work with my father, who was a producer on it. He was the physical producer. Yeah. Mace Newfeld was more, who owned the, <laughs> owned the rights. Uh, he, actually, his reader found Hunt for October before it was ever even published got Paramount to buy the rights, got Paramount to smart enough to own Jack Ryan. That was a big uh, breakup between um, the writer, uh, Tom Clancy and Paramount for years is right. that Clancy didn't realize that Paramount owned the character, Jack Ryan. So they actually ultimately never needed books to keep Jack Ryan going if yeah. they didn't want it. anyway. But so that well, they're was keeping him going now. Yeah. So, it was a chance to work with my father who I had avoided because I didn't want to hear the nepotism, you know, right. uh, BS. Um, and so I did. And then finally we were supposed to do it on a Kenneth Branagh film. He asked me to meet Kenneth Branagh on dead again, but yeah. I had already booked a trip because I had never taken a trip for years. I paid for this trip to go to Europe uh, with my first wife. And I said, I'll lose like, I, back then, it was a lot of money. It was like over five thousand dollars because yeah, you know, I didn't have insurance to you know to uh, back out of the, uh, So, but Avita was special just because it was three countries, massive, massive sequences. You know, and to have we did a sequence in downtown Buenos Aires on mm. a weekend with uh, 400, 600 extras, uh, shut down blocks and. Uh, cars chickens goats bicycles buses all that stuff and then when we saw dailies alan parker when the lights went up alan parker turned around out of nowhere and said dennis that's the best recreation of a period street scene i've ever seen done in my life and that wow. was i still get chills i just got chills just coming from you know somebody like an alan parker who's done it all or did it all sure. uh was a, a very nice compliment in front of everybody, you know, yeah, that, and, and then he didn't flow with a lot of compliments. Um, I, I adored him. I, I got to do Angela Dash's for him. So uh, I, I think he's a legend and and uh, doesn't get talked about as much as he should. We've got Annie Ellis in the chat who's saying oh. James is definitely one of the top favorites to work on. Did, is that, did yeah. you know her? An Annie, Annie's a very famous, uh, successful stunt woman, stunt coordinator. Right. Should be directing second units. Uh, her brother and I, Annie and I and her brother, David, all grew up in the north end of Malibu together. So I remember them when, like, David was in junior guards, was in the, was it what you call A's, the older boys. I was in C's. So he was a legend in Malibu as a surfer, as a waterman. And then we all ended up in the film industry, unbeknownst to us. You've also got Danny Stewart on here who says to say hello oh, to you. Yes, Danny interviewed me also. Uh, uh, oh, that, that's right. You, so you said you did another podcast recently. So yeah. you and I were both Tom Clancy fans. I mean, I read yeah. uh, Hunt for October cover to cover three, yeah. four times. Yeah. Uh, I loved Patriot Games. And when I yeah. heard they were making a movie of Patriot Games, I was so excited. And I took my parents to see it opening night in London again. And, uh, of course... If you'd read the book, you were waiting for that big ending. And yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 it's, it, you know, in the book, uh, we talked about it the other day. There's this very visual sequence where they penetrate the grounds with this maintenance truck and the uh, FBI guys, the, the Secret Service guys are kind of, 
hey, that truck's uh, not supposed to be there. They're, they're, yeah. They go and investigate it. The guys slide back the big door. They've got an M60 mounted on a tripod. And they mow down all the security guys. Two guys jump out with little rocket launchers, blow up both the police cars at the gate. I, I can remember that scene so well on the page. I can just roll it off yeah. my tongue, yeah. which is, was a, a sign of good writing. So, of course, it was a massive surprise to me that this sequence was not in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but you have told me that this sequence was filmed, but they just didn't have the time I, I, to include it. I'm not. I know. I'm not sure if we had we shot that, but, but we definitely shot the van and the attack on on um, Sean Bean in the uh, van itself. So I might be confusing because it's it was what early '90s when we shot that. Yeah, I mean it's a long uh, so, time ago, but this this, yeah. this was all part of the attack on the. Because I remember that in the book also. And I right. think it always just came down to time and money, you yeah. know, and the and the vision of an end sequence. Because we they did, because the the sequence I shot uh during main, you know, when we shot the movie had the fight on the reef because the boat crashed on the reef. Yeah. <clears throat> the two, Sean Bean and, and Harrison end up on the reef. Sean gets killed on the reef. And um, yeah, there's so when Sean dies and slips away in the water, we're doing Harrison, you know, cause we had the, the B tank. And so we had these 30,000 gallon dump tanks hitting Harrison for, you know, we had wave machines. And so I stayed on the reef the whole time Harrison was on the reef. And so right. all night long and um, just the two of us. And one time uh, the radio comes on after we all cut and, uh, uh, the, the director says, Dennis, can you ask Harrison not to flop around so much on the reef? And I grew up at the beach, grew up surfing since, I, you know, and I'm like, I'm I'm starting to laugh going, you don't control yourself. It, the water pushes you around no matter if you have a firm grip or not, you know, with all that water hitting them. I mean, I, I'm surprised he didn't drown. So right. I, I said, hey, Harrison, Philip wants you not to flop around so much. And he gave me a look and I said, I know, I know. I, I told him that you'll do the best you can. I go, don't worry. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, it was pretty comical because, yeah, to ask something like that, knowing full well, you know, he, he was lucky he didn't get washed off the, the, the actual fake reef. Right. Because it's so much water hitting him and the rain and the, we had like nine ridders full bore on this poor guy, you know, all night long. It's like, are you kidding me? He's lucky. Get to meet um, Alan Armstrong, who's in the picture here on the right. Yeah, nice man. Really a good actor too. He is. Uh, his son Joe Armstrong is also an actor, and actually, uh, Alan is one of the first actors I ever wrote to to come and see one of my plays, and he wasn't oh. able to make it, but he very kindly wrote wrote back to me. Um, and he he misunderstood the spelling of my name, and he wrote back and said "Dear Louise," which was hilarious. And oh, I was like, yeah. hey, "My name's Lance." Um, yeah. Which, but but uh, you might not remember, but he's the guy that's carrying the chicken um, in the uh, C-47 to parachute into Arnhem in a bridge too far. Oh, so I didn't he, remember that. But uh, yeah, yeah, I loved A Bridge Too Far. It was a great film. Yeah. Um, Retro Nerd Girls popped in, who's got her own channel oh. all about older movies. And she's just been listening in. To oh, this thank and you. Yeah. Great stories I, from Dennis. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, uh, indeed, and we're, we're still going. Yeah. Uh, are you I, still okay for time, Dennis? I just want to check. Oh, oh I am. I, noticed, I I probably should turn on some lights, but um, I, I notice how dark it's getting. That that's fine. Uh, we're we're all good here. I'll still, I've still got we've still got quite a bit to cover. So, but just uh, just saying, if you do need to dash to the bathroom, just no. let us know, and uh, Russell will improv for yeah. five minutes. Okay. Uh, but uh, so uh, uh, in terms of Patriot Games, yeah. I can't remember it, how f financially successful that that movie was. I mean, obviously I, there were there were I, other. I uh, think it was a, about. I remember the reason that Alec Baldwin got bumped off. Well, they also the studio was worried about because Hunt for October wasn't Alec Baldwin's movie per se, even though he was Jack Ryan. It was a yeah. Sean Connery movie, and everybody yeah. knows that. Yeah. So when Patriot Games came up, they were worried about the budget. And as when we were in pre-production, so they also knew that Alec was already committed to do Broadway. 
uh, what was a, a cat on a hot tin roof, I think with Jessica Lang, if right. I remember correctly. So we pushed a couple times where it became apparent that he couldn't do the film. He'd have to go off and start rehearsals for the play. Paramount had just shut down a film that was early, early in prep. So they had a pay or play on Harrison Ford. So over the weekend, Alec went away and Harrison Ford. So Monday morning, a group of us flew to Jackson Hole, picked up Harrison, flew to D.C., to do some scouting and some casting and for Harrison to meet some CIA agents and to do some research. So right. I actually sat in the director of the CIA's office itself. Wow. And Harrison knew that we were told we would never see the anti-terrorist area of Langley. Right. It was, we'd never see it. No way. Um, and so when we're sitting there and the director, we were about to say goodbye and all that. He said, is there anything else? And, so Harrison pipes up and he says, I know it's, you know, uh, probably not possible, but is there any way just to see the environment? He goes, even if I can't talk to agents, could I just see the environment to get a feel? And, and so he, all the, under, the deputies all got this look of like, oh my God, he's asking what we said no to multiple times. <laughs> right. And so the director turns and says, well, I think we can make that happen. Wow. So, they allowed Harrison, me, and the director to go to the actual anti-terrorist area of Langley. We had to sign like a three-page document that we would not divulge anything that we saw. And Harrison and I are both signing. And he looks at me, he goes, would you know what we're seeing? I go, no, sir. I would have no clue what we'd be looking at. And so that would have been the basis for that scene with the... Uh, where the all the analysts. Guys, yeah. We, that was Hampton. built. And, yeah. So yeah. once I saw what they had, which was really an embarrassment, it was really low budget, like the little uh, gray little divider walls that you see in bad offices and stuff. Yeah. And it was just really cheesy. And so when we went back to Los Angeles, I met with the production designer and did a debrief. And I, and I had been a prop maker, so I took copious notes in my head. And I told him what I even from the little chain signs like Middle East, Far East, China, you know, all these for the different divisions. And he started laughing and he goes, oh, so Paramount flew out those deputies as sort of a thank you. And they walked on the set and were blown away what they saw. They go, how come we can't have this? <laughs> <laughs> I said, great. because the government designed it, not a production designer. And that's how you got your new gig as the designer yeah. of FBI offices. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, RRTNZ is talking about the, the scene in question uh, where the camp is wiped out while Wyatt, Ryan and Greer are watching it. Feels really sinister and so ahead of its time. And I always remember that line where somebody sees somebody get gets gets killed and he goes, that's a kill right there. Yeah. To the, so so that that technology was actually old technology by the time we made the film, because they told right. us that one of the right. one of the deputies said to me because I asked him. But the, where we shot that, once again, I used my experience. And so I told my father and I told the production designer and the director, I said, we sh we can shoot that because Philip wanted to go to Morocco. And of course, it was like, you know, a huge expense. So yeah. I, I brought up to my father. Uh, Yuma, Arizona. I go that we have the sand dunes, we have all that. The, you know, it's one of the biggest sand dunes in North America, is outside of Yuma, Arizona. Uh, basically, I think it goes from the Mexican border north of Yuma, even is this big band of sand dunes, anyways. And the ATVs and motorcycles go out there all the time, so yeah. that's where we shot that. And, um, so moving on to um, okay. Another movie, uh, and sorry, unless you want to add anything else about Patriot Games before we move on. No, I mean it was it was a tough shoot because once again it was three major locations and moving people, and it was funny because we literally moved from London to Annapolis and only had like a day of downtime to sort of get together and and start up again. So the DP Dominic Alpine and I got all the camera gear through customs ourselves. We had like multiple carts saying this is you know personal luggage yeah. it's pre-9-11 so they they just kind of looked at it as funny and 
I don't think they even opened up one case with all this. Yeah, that, that, that would be very, very different now. And you'd be there uh, for a couple yeah, of oh, hours. We, we'd never get it through it, it, unless you had the president or some higher up make a phone call to do so that. Yeah. What uh, you, you said, Avita and Patriot Games were two of your best experiences. You, you didn't yeah. say what was your worst. If you don't want to say that's okay. But if you do um, want to say, please do. You know, I, I don't – because you always take away – you know, I always told people, you know, producers especially, I go, you pay me to be optimistic, you know, especially when you're building a schedule and what you can do and what you can't do and what you can't accomplish. I mean, yeah, I mean, even the specialists, you know, with Sharon being so difficult and delaying us and whatnot and – uh but I took, there's a lot of positives I took away from the specialists, from crew members and doing sequences and whatnot. And I mean, I put Jerry Weintraub underneath the helicopter in his Suburban to get Sharon to drive the, uh, I think it was a Mustang, convertible Mustang along that famous causeway that goes from South Beach back over. And, you know, cause she was not going to do it. And I said, no, Sharon, it's safe. I promise you, this is the best Hollywood pilot. You know, we, we rehearsed this with stunt doubles. I, I know we can do that. So one of the things I said, I'll go watch, I'll put Jerry's, I'll put Jerry underneath the helicopter, literally underneath the blades in the car, in his car. Right. And uh, we did the shot. So she did the shot with Sly and Sly was being helpful, you know, but he did, he wasn't driving. He was the passenger. So, uh, right. but he was trying to be helpful and saying it's, it's going to be fine. You know, it's okay. Those kind of thing. And we did. We ended up getting the shot into the ending of the movie. It's a fabulous shot, actually. So, I mean, at the end of the day, there's always something positive to take from even the most difficult or challenging of experiences. Yeah, I, I mean, Hard Target had its issues because of Jean-Claude Goddamn. Oh, we're, we're but, coming on to that. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I, I, definitely want to, I definitely want to cover that before we wrap up, for okay. sure. Um, that's I've got about three or four more I want to talk about. Okay. One, of them is, right. one of them is Soldier. Now, oh, I had yeah. a friend who worked on this who, who said oh. to me, he worked on this and Armageddon very close together. Oh. He said, <laughs> we're talking about Jason Isaacs. Oh, yeah. Oh, great guy. And, oh, I, and I, I, I really yeah, like Jason. I, I, I think he's a, one of the most talented actors living yeah. today. Fantastic and, actor. And he had a deal with Gary, as we, as we call him, Gary Abusey. Gary Busey. So I, I tip yeah, my hat to Jason. <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. Gary Busey's a character. Well, Jason said that he went from working on Armageddon, which was, as he described it, Battle of the Egos, which is when he came to do his shots, no one was there except for the crew. And yeah. and he said, contrasting that with Soldier, where, um, you know, he's in quite a lot of the shots. And yeah. uh, um, Kurt, he's doing his reverses with Kurt Russell. And, yeah. and Kurt Russell, he said, Kurt Russell was there for every shot feeding him the lines, everything. And he, and he, and he said, yeah, Kurt, this is such a contrast oh, to the film. I just you worked died, on. You, Yeah. Another guy you died and went to heaven with. I forgot about Kurt as one of the guys I, I, I fully respect. I mean, Kurt, he, Kurt saw me doing all the off camera shots for the little boy in the movie. They were actually yeah. twins. And yeah. I, I, I pissed off Jerry Weintraub and I pissed, I definitely pissed off the casting director who I, I had known since I was seven years old. Mindy Marin, a legend casting director. And I said to them, I go, guys, we can't shoot this movie on schedule if I don't have twins. The little boys in so much, you know? Yeah. So she cast great little boys and they were wonderful. And the parents were rock stars. The parents gave me tickets to a Laker game, you know, out of nowhere. Huh. I mean, bizarre. But anyway, so Kurt saw that I was doing all this stuff with the kid, you know, uh, either boy. I, I was doing it, rolling around the dirt, getting them to react because uh, Paul Anderson was young. I think Paul was only 30 years old when he directed yeah. the movie. Yeah. And so he didn't really, I don't think he had any experience with ch children, you know, acting or no, children I don't in think general. So before this. I had kids, so I, I got it. So Kurt one time said, Hey, do you need help off camera? And I went, Well, I, I would never ask you to do that. <laughs> he goes, No, I don't mind because he was a child actor. You know, yeah. he was at Disney. You know, he told me wonderful stories about him and and Walt Disney. You know, anyway. Mm. So he, even though he wasn't needed, he was doing stuff to get the kids to re the either boy to react, like right. literally rolling around in dirt for me. 
I mean, yeah, Jason Fleming's another actor that I've worked with who's definitely cut oh. from the, the same cloth as Kurt yeah. Russell. Yeah. You, you may have met him on Rockstar because he was in it. He's in the first 15 minutes. Yeah. But, the name's really familiar. You know, there again, I was working for David Ellis, who did all the second unit for well, uh, we'll, that director. We'll, 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 we'll come back to that. But yeah. um, Soldier was uh, Soldier an interesting yeah. film because it, it yeah. felt like a a movie that should have come out in like 1988 instead of 1997. It felt like an 80s yeah. action movie. I, I quite like it. You know who it. was supposed to do it? We no, were supposed no. to go from The Specialist to Soldier with um, with Stallone. Right. And I then he backed, out of, he backed out of it. That would have been a very different movie with Stallone. Yeah. In. yeah. I think Kurt Russell was did a great job. Yeah, that planet was built at on at Warner Brothers on this. It's a it's a one acre stage. It's stage sixteen where they do. You, the, to, we took out the pit so you could have, you know, some films like they did um, the Spielberg thing with the 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 pirate ship with uh, what's her anyway. So oh, that was oh. three stories high. And right. We had a a DC three stuck in there. We had part of a train stuck in there. Yeah, it was a, a massive set. You could get lost. Right. Oh, I would have loved to have um, seen that. It was that. pretty cool. It, it, and that that was the, the he David Schneider was the art director on the uh, Ridley Scott thing um, with Harrison Ford. Um, uh, famous movie. Um, and uh, uh, but David designed all that. Great Blade great. Runner. Blade Runner. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, Blade Runner. Yeah. No, so, I, I mean, I like I like Soldier. I, I think it's a film that's got better with with time. Yeah, I think on, on its release, it felt quite. It came out at a bit, at a bit of a weird yeah. and, time and with those, because those he didn't have of... any dialogue. People were were uh, put off because the lead character doesn't talk. Oh, I, I, I don't mind that. I think I, it's no, fun. it was because Kurt can act just by being there. Yeah, he doesn't need so a do bunch you, of dialogue. Do you remember the two crawler? vehicles yeah. that were designed they, especially. they were built special yeah. for that that yeah i was on top of them all over them yeah, well, yeah. Do, you, uh, do you know what happened to those i don't i don't you know because you know they're owned by the studio eventually um yeah. and so i don't know if they sat on the back lot until they rotted away i mean they were because they were i think they were built on top of sort of cargo movers from airports or something correct and with all yeah. the extra bits and bobs on and yeah. I thought they looked so cool. I, I they, you know that was there again. That was David Schneider, you know, his vision and his people and and I forget the fabricators. Um they're was well it, known fabricators and was LA. it a fun was it a fun shoot overall? It was it, it was, you know, because um Goldie would turn up with the dogs and this kind and of Goldie thing. Goldie would turn up and so yeah. with uh uh uh, uh Kurt's stepdaughter she, when she came on the set, of course, everything stopped. And because uh, she was cute and bubbly and adored Kurt and considered Kurt her dad and not uh, Bill, um, uh, what's his name? Um, this is uh, uh, the girl. She's an actress now, isn't she? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Su yeah. Incredibly successful. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. And, and Goldie knew me from Protocol. And then Goldie knew me from my dad did shampoo with Goldie. And then Goldie uh, owned a house on Broad Beach. And so I'd see her on the beach and. I would go over and say hi to her, you know, and just for a bit and say hi and, and go back to our beach club, you know, where I grew up, uh, Malibu West. And, uh, um, and so, yeah, just nice, nice people, you know, and, uh, uh, I can't say anything, uh, you know, more Kurt, Kurt is, and Kurt told me the whole story about, um, the baseball picture that, uh, set up Kevin Costner, um, and uh, he had been meeting with that writer director for months and months because Kurt Kurt made it all the way up to Triple A baseball because that was his his passion was baseball. Right. Acting acting afforded him to go play minor league baseball, and so uh, uh, then when the the studio was going to make the film, they wanted Kevin Costner, and Kurt got bumped off the film. Unfortunately. Is that you? Are you talking about the postman? No, no, not the postman. The baseball picture. Um, oh, uh, Field of Dreams. Field of Dreams. Not, not Field, Field of Dreams. Oh, I love that movie. Not, not Field of Dreams. The other baseball one. Oh, oh uh, Bull Durham. Bull Durham. 
Yeah. Well done. So that, those were all so many baseball Russell baseball. minor league yeah. baseball stories from like sliding on the field in the rain, uh, uh, all that stuff. Yeah, that, that was Kurt stories. Right. So you worked on Hard Target as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we've got to talk about this because obviously this was – it's probably one of Van Damme's best movies. Um, yeah. I mean, there again, John John Wu, I knew from Hong Kong movies. And right. I, to this day, I never f figured out who put my name in for the film because I knew no one. None of the producers. Obviously, I hadn't met John Wu because he lived in Hong Kong. But I knew I'd seen his films. And so I took the meeting because I was a fan of those Hong Kong movies. I lived in Hong mm. Kong. And, you know, so when I went to the interview, all of a sudden it was a board of directors. So it was all these producers. And then off to the side was John Wu and his producer partner, Terrence Chang. But these American producers like Jim Jacks and Sean Daniels and this guy, Rob Tappert, they did all the questions mostly. And, but I kept look, referring to John and then, but eventually I think it was Rob Tappert asked me, he goes, well, how long do you think it would take for us to shoot this kind of a movie? And so I said, well, um, how big of a second unit are you planning? And the, and the, he goes, well, we're not going to have a second unit. We have the best uh. acting director in the, in the world. Why would we have a second unit? And I said, well, we have second units because we don't want first unit shooting so long. <clears throat> and I know I had known John did all his shooting in Hong Kong. So the shortest film John had done in Hong Kong was 120 days. Right. So I, I said, well, I, I go, it's going to be 95 days of first unit, even though I hadn't done a board or schedule yet. I just read the script. Cool. I said, I bet 95 days first unit and probably 15 days minimum second unit. And they almost fell out of their chairs. And then I looked over at John and he had a huge grin on his face. Ha <laughs> ha. That probably, that was the moment you probably got the job. I think so because I left the meeting thinking I'm not getting this job. They don't like me because you know how many days they had budgeted 58 days. Uh, I mean, and it's, it's nearly all action all the time. So eventually they let me do a board that showed like 68 days. And I knew we, that was just a lie to the studio because it was an independent, but it was a universal picture. Universal had one more deal on Jean-Claude and then they wanted him off the lot, him and his producer partner, Moshi Diamond. And so uh, we were several weeks into shooting when they came and started talking to me about, well, what would you put off to second unit? Because we had a very famous stunt coordinator, Billy Burton, who was a stunt coordinator and a second unit director. And so I knew that Billy should be shooting a lot of this stuff without first unit, you know, being in the way. You know, mm. why would we shoot second unit work as a f big old first unit? So I started, I said, well, give me time and I'll pull out stuff that should be second unit that Billy Burton should shoot. And uh, you could spin off my second AD to be the first if you're not going to bring somebody in because my second second and my staff can sort of pick up and then we could shoot when I'm like in the warehouses and stuff, whatever. And that's what we did. And then we eventually shot so long we had to go home for Christmas. So they had to ask everybody to go up payroll because we were supposed to be done weeks before Christmas. And we were not a prayer finishing. We went into like February eventually. So we did shot, we shot about 95 days of first unit and 15 days of second unit. Right. I mean, um, you got to work with, uh, we'll talk about Jean-Claude in a sec, but you got yeah. to work, you got to work <laughs> well, that, with Wilfred yeah. Brimley, who's, one of my favorite actors of all yeah. time. But and a pain I, in the ass. Was he a pain? Oh, beyond. Oh, and you grumpy, know what? I heard that from somebody man. else as well. Just he could a, be difficult. Uh, unfortunately, grumpy old man, you know. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, maybe he wasn't always grumpy yeah. in every movie, but uh, that's a yeah. shame to hear that. What a, what a yeah, shame. Yeah, like one him. day we're, we're on the set and the, 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 the camera assistant's putting down marks, you know, and running the tape out. <laughs> And he starts giving the poor young guy shit. And I, I so I, I I just couldn't watch it. You know, and so I went up, hey, hey, Wilford, Wilford, the marks are for him, not for you. But since you don't like marks, they put marks 
for for distance because if you're out of focus we're going to do this all day long until it's in focus so he has to have focus marks because you won't hit marks so he kind of looked at me and he gave me that eye that stink eye of his mm. and then he, he grump he grumbled a little bit and then he left the after that he never bothered the camera system again and they thanked me for it i said of course i'm going to stick up for you guys how is go, lance henriksen Lance was a terrific guy, and I felt bad for him because he had to deal with Jean Claude so much, you know. So I mean, this probably would have been at the height of Jean Claude's admitted he's admitted this. Uh, he had a huge cocaine addiction. Oh yeah, yeah. He he was doing so much down there, and and everybody knew it. And there was also an incident with him and his stand-in and a young girl you know, back at the hotel that they had to get everybody involved, the studio, the local police agents, managers. Yeah. It was a big deal and it wow. got squelched, you know, it was way before the hashtag, you know, hashtag me too, whatever it's right. called, you know, and all the stuff that's going on now in Hollywood, you know, sure. you know, um, but how did you find working with John? Uh, after oh, that? Well, wonderful. You know, and you know, I had worked with, you know, foreign directors. So I, I kind of, you know, would pick up and his English was fine, even though everybody thought it was, you know, broken English. I go, no, I got it. You know, he would start to say something I and I would, you know, help finish it for him, you know, and he goes, yes, yes. You know, it's very, it's very much a John Woo film. It's got that oh, stamp oh, on it. Especially if you see his Hong Kong movies, they're shots for shots, you know, even yeah. to the point where the, the doves, you know, the yeah. where we use pigeons, you know, um, but yeah, and, and I got that he, he wanted his brand in his first American movie. I mean, it's yeah. funny because most people don't like mission impossible too. Yeah. Um, I think I'm the only guy who absolutely loves mission impossible. Yeah. Two. Uh, there again, what's, what's wrong with mission impossible two as opposed to one and three and four, you know, it's, like, I, I, it's way better than the first one, which is yeah. very clunky. I think yeah. it's better than the third. Um, and I, I really like the style of the action in it because I like John Woo ballet action. You know, I like it. You can tell who's firing at who and who's being hit. And it's not all yeah. Jerry Bruckheimer. You know, your you your friend Peter is great with multiple cameras and ballet. But John Woo would have like two dollies going at the same time. Another, you know, this on a little jib arm. You know, he, he could choreograph not only the action, but the cameras, you know, because... Our DP at the time, even though he won an Academy Award for Titanic, but everybody knows that James Cameron is the DP, gaffer, operator, director, producer, lead actor, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so Russell was in awe of what J John knew. Lenses, he knew exactly what he wanted. There was no mystery. Have you seen the much coveted John Woo cut of Hard Target? Apparently no, they, yeah. no, never. Uh, uh I didn't that even know what released on an anniversary Blu-ray. I think. Um, oh, I would love to see it. Yeah, yeah. so would I. I I've not, yeah. I've not seen it. Uh, Wayne, my birthday's coming up, buddy. So if you yeah. want to send me a Blu-ray of that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd be, yeah. uh, I'd be no, really. I, I, would, uh, I would love to find it and watch it. Yeah. So, um, you also worked on later in your career. You worked on a film which I've got to say for me was. Uh, I thought it was going to be a great movie. And unfortunately, I, I, you know, despite it having a couple of my favorite actors in it, damn, it sucked. Um, and that was the postman. Yeah. You know, there again, that was epic. It was shot in four different States, 118 day schedule. I mean, um, it looked great. It looked great. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, the protege to, um, uh, he was a DP on dances, but uh, didn't want to do Postman. I, I don't remember what the conflict was, but we had the same crew, grip, camera, grip, electric from the Postman, uh, right. uh, from, from dances on the Postman. And it was uh, a Steve, Steve, Steve Winbury. Yeah, not Winbury, Steve Windham. Right. And, um, but there again, I mean, Kevin, you know, I like Kevin. I think Kevin's very talented in a, a lot yeah, of aspects of, making films but kevin avoided going through it's the only film in my career that i never went through the script with a director right you know he spent a week playing golf with tiger woods up at the uh 
Monterey, uh, what do they call it now? Um, what? Yeah, that that famous. It used to be started out in the fifties and sixties as like the Bing Crosby Open. Now it's called. Yeah, it yeah. probably has some brand, some corporation name. So I lost a week of prep there. He took his kids skiing for a week. He went to the Clinton inauguration for a week. Um, you know, right. I'd sit outside. I would sit outside his office even, and he'd sneak out the back door. So I just think he didn't want to commit to stuff. So I met with his producer <laughs> partner. I said. I don't think Kevin likes me. So you guys should replace me now before it's, you know, we get too far into this and get enough. And, he, and his partner was like, no, 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 he likes you. I go, Oh really? I go, this is the first film. I'm not going through the script with a, with a director. I go, I know what we'll probably need. So we'll have all the toys there full time. I could save you money if I know when we need cranes and certain things, sure. but, um, but, if I don't know, then we're going to just have to carry them because if all of a sudden he turns to uh, do a crane shot over here, we better have the crane, you know, anyway. So it was, it was big. And there again, you know, we had some pretty big, we had what we call our reenactors, which I, you know, re met on, um, the, yeah. uh, I met him on, on, um, uh, uh, Rambo three. And then I re met him on, on postman. Cause we use them because you get a man. Like the the yeah, yeah. So they come, they they sleep on the location. They're either in tents or motorhomes or whatever campers. Sure. Um, and, Saves uh, you a lot of money. Yeah. So you you just have a corral built. You have make sure you have a vet on call. Uh, you feed the horses and uh, you give them X amount of money, and they and you put out. Uh, we have these big trailers that are showers and bathrooms. So yeah. they can take a shower every day and honey wagons to, and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, it, it's just simple to to order them up. And uh, how how was how was Will Patton? On, Will was he, fine. And they, yeah, you know, I had interviewed on the film where they did together uh, um, the the film in D.C. Um, they did No Way Out. No Way Out. It, when I interviewed, a, it was called a good Fini movie. It was called Finished Engines. And then they changed the title because Finnish engines is a Navy term and nobody knew what it meant. Even people in prep didn't know what it meant. Anyways, right. I didn't get the job. And then they, they ended up, you know, he, Kevin likes Will and I think definitely respects him as an actor. Yeah. He's so an amazing actor. Yeah. Will's, Will's a bit odd. You know, he's, he's a, a keeps to himself. Doesn't really interact with anybody. But that's um, that's okay as long as he yeah, turns yeah, up on time yeah, and doesn't cause problems. And nope. you know, some actors are like that. That's yeah. Fine. Showed up, showed up every day, was prepared, never complained, never threw a hissy fit. You know. How was Olivia Williams? I oh, actually met just, I met her a few years ago. Yeah, just a, a, a great lady. You know, very. She was young at the time. Um, I I lost track of her now, but she she did well for a long time. You know. Uh, got cast in a, a lot of other films, you know. That was supposed to be Neil Young, but then Neil got Tom Petty instead. Well, Neil's schedule changed, so Kevin came to me and he said, "You know, what are the dates that we need somebody to play the mayor of Bridge City, which was this little town in the north? We were seven miles from the Canadian border, and it's a famous river that goes that one of the few rivers that flows north in North America." It comes out of Washington and flows into Canada, believe it or not. And so they let us build that bridge city uh, in that. And it was, you know, a bunch of safety issues. But, you know, you just have to tell the crew, you know, you're yeah, in a dangerous yeah. location. Don't climb on the wall. You can look over the edges, but, you know, you got to be safe. And everybody respected it. So it worked out. But Petty was great. And, um, uh, yeah, it's just what it was epic, you know, and then. The day we were doing, because in the movie, you know, he goes on that cable through the valley, right? In yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, obviously that. What? So we knew we had to do Kevin in a basket underneath the helicopter and filming him air to air. We knew we had to build these massive blue screens or green screens and build a short rig for, you know, I don't know, 100 yards, you know, to do other work, all that stuff. So mm. all of a sudden. Uh, the day before the Warner brothers safety guy comes up and then that day, you know, I told him, you know, we watched all the rigging and everything and whatnot, but all of a sudden he walks up to me and he's handing me a cell phone 
And I go, uh, who's on the phone? And he goes, um, Bob Daly and Terry Semmel. And boing, my eyes lit up because they're the legends. They ran Warner Brothers for decades. Ah, the two okay. heads of Warner Brothers forever. And I'm like, I've never even met them. What if they're calling me? So I answer, hello, gentlemen. Um, this is Dennis. And uh, so they go, both of them basically say, we don't want Kevin flying underneath a helicopter. Right. And I go, uh, so I, I just go, well, gentlemen, I go, I'm not sure if it's my position to tell my director that. I go, isn't that Jim Wilson's job, his partner and producer? And of course, there was no way in hell Jim Wilson was going to tell Kevin Costner no on something. So it was left up to me. And I go, well, gentlemen, you both know Kevin's going to do it no matter what anyone says. And so I will make sure the production ref report reflects that Dennis McGuire refused to do the shot. But the other Dennis McGuire will make sure the shot is done safely and blah, blah, blah. And we did it and we safely did it. And it, it's in the movie. And so I was in the camera ship directing everybody and choreographing it and whatnot. And we got there's phenomenal shots that we did do. And um, but I understood their position. And but my position was who's going to it wasn't my position to tell the 20 million dollar gorilla that he can't do the shot. I mean, because Kevin directed the film, if I remember Kevin rightly. produced the film, directed the film, kind of even though Brian Hagelin was the writer. But there were other people that Ghost writ, wrote for Kevin and Kevin made his. So scripting. it must have been a, a pretty hands on experience for you because you know, well, when someone's directing the film and also the leading man. Yeah. yeah. Would, you, would he kind of, watch every take or, you know? Well, he, he did watch a lot often, but a lot of times he would just go, let's go again and then watch a series of them. And, uh, you know, but I was always hoping and praying that he liked and we could move on because. What, what, what was a, a typical number of takes on the postman that Kevin would like to do and then move on to the next shot? It, it was pretty reasonable compared to other directors, believe it or not. Oh, I, I, I can believe it. Uh, Cause yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I always yeah. want to get two good ones. If I'm on a set, I want to yeah. get, you know, uh, however many cock ups there are. Yeah. I want two that are clean. I've got to have two choices at least. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm, I'm not a, I, I don't get why like David Fincher has to do 98 takes, you know, no, I'm, I'm and, not... <laughs> you know, but the guys like even Alan Parker, he knows he's got it within a couple takes. So why, why are yeah. we doing it? It's like yeah. Clint Eastwood. If you go more than twice, why, you know, yeah. Eastwood always wants to know why. Yeah. You know? I so, was, um, because you know, I, yeah, I like used to a, just to I, do the general multiple takes, but then yeah, you know, unless something went wrong or the focus puller said I need one more, but that was rare too because we had such a great crew. You know, you had you know wonderful crew. Um, yeah, know, everybody grip, electric, and camera. You know, and <laughs> and our makeup and hair and wardrobe. You know, we had it was it was big all the time. Also, you yeah. know, yeah, you had a lot of people on set. Yeah. And it was interesting because they were they were wanting to. Well, our visual effects meeting went on forever. They went months and months, pre-production, during shooting, and then so we're coming down to where we got to shoot the, the, the basket sequence. So we have the basket. We all have that all up there. But the weather in Medellin Falls was hor horrific. If it wasn't raining, it was windy. So I said to them one time in our, one of our meetings, you know, lunch meetings, with like a dozen you know, people. Um, and I just looked at everybody I go, you know, I grew up sailing. I go, we, we don't even have the cranes here. The cranes are going to have to come from Seattle. These, you know, and they're bit, they're going to be big cranes. They're going to be like 250 ton cranes to hold up these 40 by 40 foot, either blue or green screens. Cause everybody had, you know, the visual effects woman wanted some green or blue, you know, or some other people, you know, whatever. It's like the discussions went and Kevin never came to him. I ran him. So right. I finally said, this is ridiculous. And I just said, we should be on the back lot at Warner Brothers, the old Columbia Ranch, because it's one guy in a basket. It's one makeup, one hair, one wardrobe. And I, I don't need, we were, we were 360 people strong in Medellin Falls. They moved a little lady out of a, what we call a modular home, you know, mm. 
uh, because I didn't want to go all the way up into Canada with the crew every day to a hotel. I go, I, I can't do that. I, I go, forget it, you know? And um, so about two hours later, I'm on the set, it's raining. All these, you know, hundreds of extras are wet from kids to adults, you know, every day. And um, I felt badly for them all, but they stayed with us. And um, I said, you know, uh, all that. And then somebody walked up to me and I looked and it was Jim Wilson, Kevin's producer partner. And I go, oh, hi, Jim. I go, are you mad at me? Because I, I figured he was coming about what I said at lunch and then right. kind of grabbed, grabbed the DP. And I said, we're out of here. We got to go back to work. We're late. You know, everybody's waiting on us again. And so uh, he said, no, he goes, you really believe that? I go, yes, Jim. I go, I don't need the circus. You know, I, and so several days later, all of a sudden, my second handed me the call sheet, but there was a note on it. I said, what's the note about? He goes, oh, give it a read. You'll get a chuckle out of it. And it basically was a letter from production saying the basket flying sequence will be moved back to Los Angeles. Uh, please note that Dennis will be revising the uh, the shooting schedule to reflect. Yeah, brilliant. And they didn't even come up to me. The accountant on the film said I saved them over a million and a half dollars. I never got a thank you, never, yeah, nothing. You should, should have got a bump in your salary for that. <laughs> when um, we were on the back lot, it was like the second or third day, we had five days of this basket sequence, you know, because there's cranes and special effects. Yeah, yeah, and, sure. And all that stuff, you know. So, and Kevin, and so... I got word that Bob Daly and Terry Semo wanted to come visit the set. Is there, would that be okay? And I go to my second, I go, of course, tell production. They own it. I, mean, I go, they don't have to ask the first AD, but it was a courtesy, I'm sure. Anyway, so they did, they came out in the limousine and they, they were chatting with Kevin for a while. And I was over at the set where everybody, and eventually out of the corner of my eye, I saw Bob Daly, Terry Semo, and at that time, the president of the film division was Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, who had been a Warner Brothers exec and worked his way up to president. And so I knew I knew who they were, but I had never met them. So they came walking to, towards the set by themselves. And I realized, wait, I think they're walking towards me. So I turned to greet them and they shook my hands and all three of them said, thank you. We know who brought this film on schedule and on budget. And I'm like, we're over schedule and we're over budget. But to them, they said, we thought we had another water world when we greenlit this. They were prepared well, they, for, I they mean, were prepared you know, they for the, in the box office at that time, of course. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, that was very crazy. nice of them. It was that, a, film, that film had a lot of good things going for it. But. Well, you know, it was a bestseller in, in the sci fi, <laughs> yeah, the, the New York Times. So yeah. Uh, I had found out when I took the job that a friend of mine uh, told me that Dick Donner tried to make it years earlier, but right. then ended up passing on it. Maybe he turned uh, it down. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it was uh, best that he, uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. It it was it was epic. I never read the book um, uh, because you know by the time I got asked to interview and you know once again it was like interview, get hired, and go to work. You know, because there again, they thought there was another assistant director that was going to do the film for Kevin, the guy that did dances. But he sure. turned it down because he didn't want to go through it again. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to rush through a couple of things. Oh, OK, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just conscious of time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not uh, Dennis, very yeah. grateful for the time you're giving us. I, I'm also aware of the fact that I'm due to do an interview in 40 minutes. Someone's interviewing oh. me in 40 minutes. Oh, so um, <laughs> yeah. I know, right? Uh, uh, so I just want to make sure we we get these things in before we have okay. to wrap right. up. So uh, quick answers to these uh, okay. from again, it's RRT and Z. Okay. We, we done Who would you have liked to have worked with, but you didn't get the chance? And have you worked with Clint Eastwood? That's somebody I wanted, and as a key second, I was hired. And then I got called back by the first AD for, was it a movie he did called Deadpool? Yep. Okay. I saw, I saw so that. his first AD, a very, very well known and became his producer, in fact, um, asked me to do the film. Then he called me back sometime later before I started 
and said, you know, Clint wants to get his location manager into the DGA. And the way to do it is hire him as the key second on location. And I said, I understand. And I didn't get to do that. And I wanted to, to I wanted to do, yeah. yeah. So the answer uh, to both questions would be Clint Eastwood, really. Clint Eastwood, yeah. 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 Um, that's a, yeah. yeah, that's a shame. Now, yeah. you also worked with Ridley Scott. Yes. On Black, on Black Rain. Yes. So Black Rain, uh, they pushed Ridley to go to Japan. Ridley yeah. wanted to go to Hong Kong, but the studio and the producers pushed Japan on him. They were being sabotaged in Japan. And I know this because Ridley told me personally about it when I got hired and, and was flown up. I got hired in the morning by the production manager. Uh, and told to go to LAX and there's a ticket. And I had to ask him, I said, well, where am I going and for how long? It was Mel Deller, my mentor. And he yeah. laughed, he goes, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm just frantic. I'm already in, in uh, Napa Valley and we're filming and, and the clock's ticking because there's a stop date on Michael Douglas because they went over schedule uh, being sabotaged and they brought the whole picture back and they shot Napa Valley for that whole end sequence. If you saw Black Rain, the yeah. cutting of finger the motors so i believe it or not i would meet with ridley there were no storyboards so i would meet with ridley and jake would hold a sketchboard ridley would draw me hand-drawn storyboards of what to get each morning right. and i would go off and and direct the motorcycle chase so i was basically because i bobby bass was the second year director and stunt coordinator but Ridley was doing the end fight after the crash in the vineyard, which was supposed to be Japan. And so I was, didn't realize I'm directing Michael Douglas and the Japanese actor that spoke no English. So I had to talk to his translator and tell him what I was doing. And mm. Michael was cool as shit to me. He never, in fact, one time he was walking by us and saw us sitting on the insert car because I had, I didn't have either him or the, the actor. And I, and I didn't have the doubles because he also Ridley also had the doubles. Bobby needed the doubles down there in, in the mud. And so he goes, what are you guys doing? And I go, well, we're waiting for either the doubles or for you. And he goes, I've been sitting in my trailer for over an hour. And I go, oh, sir, I was not told. I was told I couldn't have anybody. Who told you that? I go, well, kind of first unit. So he went down and raised rack. So he loved me. I mean, he wasn't a really good motorcycle rider. And it was right. hard because it was in the mud of the of the vineyards between the vines. And so we had a little 125 for him. But for close-ups, I had them strip stuff off of a of a double uh, yet another bike and put it on the back of the insert car so we could drive along and make it look like he was riding with handlebars and the whole thing and got the motion. And I put the, the Japanese double uh out in the distance. And so we could do shots, tying them together. And he was like, how do you know how to do this? And I said, well, I actually grew up riding. And I did the same type of thing with uh, River Phoenix, but he was on a horse and on Indiana Jones. And he looked oh. at me and goes, you were on Indiana Jones last crusade? I said, yes, sir. <coughs> so, yeah, it was, it was so great the, the reason The reason this stuff was shot in the Napa Valley, and I'm, I'm amazed to hear that because it really it feels like the J Japanese country. We, we, we had the, the Navy foggers, what we call Navy foggers, the big. Yeah. Navy, all that mist and it, and make it look like there was the fog and all that. Yeah. And they built was, the Japanese gangster house. And that um, was built. That was built and blown up. Yeah. So I'm oh. guessing that, um, you know, was it uh, sort of the, there was a, a lot of pushback in Japan against the film and that, that caused them lots of production problems then. Yeah. Like the same driver would get lost taking Ridley to dailies at night type thing. Right. They would show up to, they would show up to the factory where they shot stuff the day before and were told they couldn't shoot there again the next day as everybody's standing there. And they're right. like, what? Yeah. So they were basically being sabotaged. So they had, right. they, they pulled out and came back to America. Wow. That's, I mean, so, I mean, I'm guessing this shot here, was this shot in Japan or was this? A, yeah, a that, that's Japan. Okay. To the best of my knowledge. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah. But I'm so guessing it, most it was, of the, so this so, is Napa Valley. This is Napa that's Valley. Napa Valley. Correct. Amazing. So everything, that. 
yeah, everything involved at the end of the movie with the motorcycles, the attack on the the so-called farmhouse, the yeah. interior of the farmhouse was shot literally on location at the farmhouse. Yeah, so that was all built and and shot at the Domaine Chandon Vineyard in Napa Valley, which is a beautiful vineyard. Yeah, I mean it was an amazing. Um, Has a great restaurant. Yeah. I, yeah, I can. I there's quite a few of them in that area that are on yeah. my bucket list to. Yeah. Uh, if there you, you go. That's, chance, that's a road trip for us to do together, uh, Dennis. Yes. I, I, <laughs> you I, and me in the Napa Valley and some steaks. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, how many days did you did you work on uh, Black Rain? I, I was up. Th I was up there for that motorcycle. I would say I was up there several weeks, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was a pretty big sequence. And so, th the big regret I have is I should I had those um, storyboards for a long time, and then you know, in, in a box and I've, I've lost them. So it's a regret having, not having the hand drawn storyboards from Ridley. Cause he, I, he that was, would be, that'd be worth a few Bob, uh, oh, a few Bob, I'm sure, you know, or yeah. to give back to Ridley for his library of, you know, mem movie memorabilia. I, I would do that if, if, unless he said, you know, you keep them, but he, so he would see dailies of stuff we shot and then he'd go, okay, that was great. So can you, can you, I need, because of that shot, can you get me this shot? Can you do yeah. this? Is that so? He would just talk through stuff, and he was always incredibly generous with uh, saying that it's all looking great. Thank you, thank you. It was never oh, your stuff is shite. You know, you yeah, redo. So a positive, positive experience. <laughs> yeah, you know, because he knew I was on my own, and I didn't have Bobby, and I, I didn't have a lot of support. You know, because it was you know with first units, if you throw a second unit together at the last minute all the first unit people get annoyed because sure. you know, that's like, Oh, we have to do double work or they have yeah. to give up a, a, a member of their own staff because they're not going to keep bringing people up. So, um, to wrap it up, <coughs> we're, we're going to talk oh, a bit about Elm street three. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, which is one of, uh, Russ's, uh, faves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's wanna, actually my favorite from the series. You want to yeah. chuck in a couple yeah. of questions, Russ? I really only have one. Uh, I'm sure you'll cover other stuff. As Damn, well. you waited a long time to, to <laughs> ask that. Go on, well, go well I mean, a lot of the things I would have asked on the other movies was asked, so I didn't yeah. really feel I needed to. No, but, no. Uh, yeah. uh, Elm Street 3 kind of represents uh, like a shift for the series, going from a more pure horror to a comedic horror. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What were like the discussions leading up to that? Well, as it was clearly <laughs> a, a, a huge change in direction. Yeah. And uh, Wayne covers this in his book. But so yeah. I I was on location in Arkansas when I mm -hmm. got a call on a Wednesday night. And so back then there were no cell phones. So I literally was at an intersection in um, actually in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which mm -hmm. is where Bill Clinton was born and raised. Anyway, so we're there finishing up the movie. It's our last week, our uh, second to last night. And a friend of mine is doing the film as the non-union production manager because it was new lines first dga film ever so rebecca tracks me down i go to the payphone you know back then we had calling card so i call her up i call the you know the number and it's her production so she explains that she's on this film nightmare on elm street part three they're basically three days into shooting and they want to fire everybody. I go, what do you mean they want to fire everybody? <laughs> they want to fire the cameraman, camera crew, grip, electric, and assistant directors. And fr uh, by Friday night, they're going to fire everybody. Right. And I'm like, well, I finished yes, Friday morning, you know, and I'm not due to fly back. You know, I get to sleep Friday away because of turnaround. And I'll fly home Saturday. She goes, well, uh, we really want to you know, I really want you to do this film and I know we need you, blah, blah, blah. So she was championing me to New Line. So she said, well, can we do a conference call with Bob Shea, who owned New Line at the time? Uh, this is before Warner Brothers bought them. Anyway, so I said, yes. So we make a time for me to go to the payphone. I tell my second AD, I'll be gone for a while. I'm going to do another phone call, blah, blah, blah. So we do this conference call. So finally at the I, I cut to the chase. I say, okay, here's the deal. I'll get the production to change my ticket. I'll go from here to the airport at sunrise, fly home, 
I'll, I'll tell Rebecca what time I get in at LAX. I go, you guys have to pick me up at LAX, drive me to Beverly Hills to New Line. I'll meet, but then you have to drive me home. I live in Malibu and I'm not going to have my wife come to the airport, take me to Beverly Hills and take me home. I go, I've been gone for 15, 16 weeks. I go, yeah. no, I'm not going to put her through that. So you'll have to drive me home to Malibu. And they go, oh, no problem. No problem. So I, I do that. I, I don't go to bed. I get on a plane. I fly to L.A. I probably looked like crap. I felt like crap. I meet Bob Shea, uh, Sarah Risher, his right hand, this woman that's the line producer, uh, um, uh, um, Rachel Talalay, uh, Rebecca's there. Anyway, so we chat. And so meeting ends, they, uh, I get taken home. I don't hear anything until late, late Friday night that I'm going to meet. Can I meet the director Saturday afternoon when he wakes up? She's sure. Chuck, Chuck Russell. Chuck Russell, who mm -hmm. co-wrote it with Frank Darabont. Right. And so, and he gets, and he's getting a producer credit. So I go to Beverly Hills. I meet Chuck at his place. He's kind of an oddball, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we leave, shake hands. You know, I figured they were meeting other people. I don't, I think they were, but I, I was told I was the only one. Anyways, uh, Sunday afternoon, Rachel calls me, the producer, telling me I got the job. I go, wow, okay. Uh, so I go, well, I'll have my second call you uh, to do a call sheet. And she goes, well, we kind of have one roughed in. I go, well, let, let him get involved and blah, blah, blah. So I called my second. I said, we're going to work uh, on this thing. And uh, so call me after you talk to the producer and tell me where and when to go, you know. And so their first week was nights. Their second week is nights, which is like, wow, not how I would start the film. But anyway, yeah. so it took it over. So I came in after a week of filming. This movie was scheduled in 40 days. We ended up shooting 44 days because we had to reshoot the first week of filming, but with, with they were hoping within the schedule and I go, well, I'll do our best, but I can't guarantee that guys, you know, I'll, mm. I'll push and push blah, blah, blah. But you know, yeah. So it was, Chuck was very unorthodox. It was his first job directing. He had never directed before, not even a high school play. So in the beginning, there was a little push and shove, you know? And so one night within the first week I was on it, he asked to talk to me after dailies. So we go outside of the, the screening place that we were at in, in Los Angeles. And um, I could tell he was unhappy about something. And so he kind of goes in and he's like, uh, so I just put my hand up. I said, I'll save you the trouble. I go, I put my hand out to shake his hand. I go, I'll, I'll go tell them that they need to hire a first AD for tomorrow. And, you know, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And I, I don't think he was expecting that. I think he was expecting me to argue or something, or I don't know. So he, he backed away from it. And I said, I, you know, I'm just here to help you make your movie. I go, I can do it. I know how to do this movie and I can do it at where, you know, you get the time you need to do to do the stuff. And so it was a very inexperienced crew in that we were doing a lot of mechanical effects yeah. in camera, no CGI work, you know? And so yeah, a lot of times, it didn't work. And so he wanted to sit there and wait and sort of pretend he was going to be the special effects guy and tell him how to do it. When I knew right. full well, he knew nothing. Clean slate, right. knew nothing. So I'd go, no, no, Chuck, we're going to be over here. We're going to do, but, but, but no, Chuck, we're over here. All right. We're not going to stand around. We're going to be filming while they rebuild it. And then we'll come back like the bit. And it turned yeah. out to be like, like I'd always say, like the big boys do it, Chuck, you know, so here, <laughs> right. I'm helping you make your movie. So we're not going to stand around. So well, he probably learned a lot on that film. I would oh, think. he did. He did ask me to do a racer. Well, he asked me to do the blog, but I was yeah. on a film. So I recommended someone. But then it, when he got a racer, which was a huge studio film, uh, he asked me to do that. And then somebody bumped me off the picture that didn't want me. I don't know who it was. I'll never know to this day. But I, I all of a sudden was told that I wasn't that somebody else is going to do the film. And I went, okay, well, I got I got to ask this question: How was John Saxon? 
Oh, great guy. There again, a guy that came to work. I mean, the stuff that we put him through and at the middle of night having a steak and he had to sit there and all that kind of stuff, really, and a nice man, you know. I uh, just love him. Uh, that's yeah. so, I mean, we just lost him. And um, yeah, exactly. I, I was I was actually trying to get hold of him for an interview when he passed. And yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, every time I see him, uh, the, that line, I am Sador of the Maomori. Yeah. I have come here with yeah. my forces to conquer you. It's just like, yeah. uh, um, you know. So I did, I did do a podcast about Nightmare 3, and I did a, a, a interview about for the book about the whole Nightmare series. Yeah, and, I've got the, uh, uh, here's the book so, right here. Yeah, yeah, Highly yeah. recommend this, people, by yeah. my good buddy Wayne. And, and so Wayne, Wayne, Wayne is the camera. one that hooked Lance and I up. Yeah, that's right. I forgot so, about that. Uh, so Roy Wagner, the DP, has uh, great stories uh, when we did, and we when we uh, told Wayne a lot of stories and what because Roy remembered certain stories that I had forgotten, and and that I told stories that he had forgotten. You know, because we you know even though DP first AD and we didn't even know each other, so we bonded the first night. You know, in this in that. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, car lot, you know, of sure. all the bombed out cars, you know, and yeah, yeah. huge lighting setup for the first, you know, with a whole new crew and okay, guys, we're, we have to light up the world, you know, and, uh, we, we got them on schedule and started reshooting stuff. And, uh, and, um, and Patricia Arquette was only 18 years old. So, um, she had, it got to the point sometimes where we, we, we did have to uh, have either cue cards for her because she was having trouble in the beginning remembering, but a lot of it was at late at night too. So, yeah. but um, she was pleasant, but uh, very young and inexperienced. And then um, what a great actress she is now though. Well, I mean, yeah, she turned, I mean, you know. Academy Award winner. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And uh, so all the kids were terrific. None of them were a problem. You know, they were all nice people. And, um, that's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Uh, so whoever asked, uh, or said something about Roy's book. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, uh, Wayne. Yeah. That's Wayne. Yes. Thanks Wayne. Yeah. Roy, um, Roy Wagner's book. Uh, you're gonna get, yeah, a, if you need, a yeah, if you need to, uh, ask more questions, Wayne, feel free. Oh, she was a great actress. Really a nice. And Martin. Too. Yeah. What was the, what was the most challenging, <laughs> day on, on on this movie what, oh what was, every day because what we had to do was we'd shoot stuff in part of this warehouse in downtown la but on the other side of the warehouse was this 40 foot blue screen so during our days we would shoot a minimum of one blue screen shot along with all this other work and right. a lot of times it was more than one blue screen shot so it was just a lot of visual, you know, and even the uh, bit with the kids in the hospital, that was our veterans hospital next to UCLA University in Los Angeles. It's a, it's a massive footprint in Los Angeles. I think it's one of the larger veterans uh, hospitals in footprint. So it was in a, in a building that they didn't use anymore that we mm. took over. And so trying to do some of that stuff practically and why not, you know, it was funny because when the kid is being puppeted down the, the um, corridor, yeah. there's a young makeup artist with a tiny little brush painting. And I'm like, sweetheart, we're never going to see that. Please step away. <laughs> it's great. It's going to be perfect when you see it on your 40 inch TV. Trust me, you know, because when I took over that film, I knew nothing about the, the series. I knew I didn't know who Freddie was. In fact, that first night I got in trouble by the whole crew because they heard on the walkie talkie when my assistant said, oh, Freddie's still in makeup. I said, well, put the hockey mask on him and get him out here. That's why they're behind schedule. <laughs> I go, what's he in makeup for? You know, and then my assistant <laughs> came running up to me. Go, no, that's, that's Jason. I go, wait, who's Jason? And because I, 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 you know, I didn't watch these kind of movies. They weren't in my genre of uh, movie going, even as a young moviegoer i didn't watch horror movies i just didn't find them exciting um, and that, Robert, that, Robert that gap was, oh, sorry no sorry and, go on russ I, I was gonna say and that gaff is the origin of the uh of, of freddy versus jason right there everybody that's the yeah. you just heard it here that yeah. was the start of that 
<laughs> oh, I mean, um, the scene with the kid in the bed with the Playboy bunny. Yeah. Or, or yes. the nurse. Yeah. She was yeah. actually a real Playboy bunny because mm -hmm. she was hired because she didn't mind getting naked. And Chuck hit on her and they, yeah, they did the dirty deed. But uh, that poor kid lying in bed with a, a beautiful girl, you know, naked in front of him. He, that, I felt bad for him. You know, I'm sure he struggled not to get excited. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, look, uh, we're at the two hour 40 mark. This is almost as long as the David. But, but, but New Line, New Line was worried because that was their most expensive movie. It was, I think they were hoping to do it around 4 million. I think it ended up at closer to four and a half million. So yeah. that was because I think the first movie, if I remember correctly, was under a million and a half. The second one was like two, two and a half. So this was Matt. And it was like I said, it was their first DGA film. Because yeah, Chuck big, wanted to go DJ because he was in the DJ as a production manager, but he had only right. done low budget, no budget things and bad films. I mean, I looked them up and nobody had ever heard of them, you know, type right. movie. So, but uh, yeah, they were a little afraid. I mean, <laughs> I made twice the amount of money that the producer made, Rachel, right, mm. as a first AD, because okay. she, she she started out on the first one as a PA, the second one she was the accountant, the third one she was the producer. Um, I assume Robert England was was perfectly pleasant. Gentleman. Yeah. Hey, he loved the role, obviously, and he was pleasant. I mean, he was four hours in makeup back then. I'm sure yeah. they could cut that time down now because of prosthetics sure. are a lot better yeah, and yeah. the technology, even for prosthetics, is much better. But, yeah, he never – yeah, he had fun. He, he ad-libbed the line uh, when she goes in the TV. Uh, yeah. Uh, something. What was the line? Uh, do you guys remember the line? Prime time, bitch, or something? He, yeah. That was it was, uh, what was the? Uh, uh, yeah, so it's something along. It's, it's something, something along. Those welcome lines. to prime time, bitch. I think it was. Bitch, yeah. yeah, that's. I. You, you, you got it. So he threw that in one time. You know. Was was what was Wes Craven ever on the set? No, I ne was, I never met him. Ne he never came by. Because he had a executive producer role, but Correct, I guess because that was he. he yeah, he created the first one. Yeah. And uh yeah, got a bit of got a bit Wayne, of money out of it, I'm sure. Yeah, Wayne says everybody likes the first and third. Yeah, I like I, I can't stand the second one. I like the first and third. Yeah. The second and, one feels uh, like it's in a completely different series. Because I think there's right. ten of them, right? Wayne so, um, still on. Not, maybe six. I've got well oh, that, if, it, that's if, if you count the like remake later, I believe it's nine. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I actually Wait. got I got bought this for Christmas. Oh, there you go. And I, I'm not a big I'm not a big horror film guy. I like good horror, yeah. but I, good horror for me is quite rare. Yeah. But I, I See, I've always to liked me, good one. good horror was Robert Wise's movie The Haunting. Yeah, ever, that's a good film. Yeah, I saw that at Robert Wise's house as a kid. Wow. Not that even must, in the movie theater. He, 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 he brought it home and he rang up my dad and said. <laughs> Hey, I have my new film I have, and I brought it home from the studio. Would the kids like to come down? And we were all like, yeah, you know. So I remember well, look, watching. Dennis, as, as much as I hate to have to wrap things up. Oh, yeah, sorry. Have to... You're being interviewed, yeah. Well, I am in 50. I kind of regret scheduling. I thought well, there's no way yeah. we'll be going on as long yeah. as that. But I underestimated the amount yeah. of things we had to talk about. But look, yeah. we can always have you back. Well, can, um, can I ask a question? Is this can. recorded for YouTube? Because I've gotten it, multiple texts. It's asking. live. It's live, and it's going to stay on YouTube, okay. and and people can watch it at any time. Okay. All right. I'll tell. I'll tell friends that didn't get to see it live. Yeah. That they so can see it. um, no, they can come back and uh, and watch it again. I just okay. want to uh, thank you most sincerely for giving up your time. No, I'm flattered on. to be asked. You know. No, not uh, look. At the end of the day, actually, the, the, the I want to interview. I think I told you I want to interview everybody on every position on a set, even a caterer. Okay. But the ads are always <laughs> the people that have the most interesting stories because they are the problem solvers. That's yeah. their main job. And, and I mean, a director is a problem solver as well, but yeah. no. the director is only as good as their ads. And um, you, you know, I don't think no. that the cinema going audience really appreciates yeah. uh, the jobs that ADs do. And I think now yeah. anyone who watches this will have uh, a bit more of an insight into just yeah. how much film production depends on you guys. So no, because we're, we're there to support the director and they, and a lot of them forget that 
you know, we may do a lot more films than they do in their career because we have to, we don't get that kind of money they get and we have families to feed. And so yeah. we'll take experiences from other movies, like I said, and say, Oh, but if you do it this way, you'll get the shot, you know? And, and even, you know, on misery, I suggested a couple shots, like uh, when the Mustang, when Jimmy Khan's car crashes in the snow, we had multiple cameras, but we didn't have any down by the crash site. And so I was talking to David Ellis, who was our stunt coordinator and second year director. I said, David, we, we should have a camera where the, and he goes, oh yeah, I go, we even have IMOs that I don't think we've even placed yet. So Rob Reiner overheard us talking. So he came over and he said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And Rob's a big guy. And he said, and I said, oh, nothing's wrong. I just thought it's always fun, to, especially in snow, you're going to get a big whiteout as uh, Ari Rondell, a famous stuntman and second year director himself, was doing the, the stunt. And so Dave is like, yeah, he's right. You know, we, it, it'd be a cool shot to have because we are only going to get to do this <laughs> once, you know. And so uh, Barry Sonnenfeld, the DP, got upset. But when Rob saw the dailies and saw the shot, he turned around and said, thank you. You know, it's a great shot. All right. I think Lance has to go. Oh, no. Sorry, I just had a cough then. That was why I turned my oh, camera off. Um, yeah, I had no, a couple no, yeah, I so, do. I do have to go. This is the only time yeah. I've I've ended an, interv an interview before my guest is willing. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> I <I'll laughs> normally run it. Help, if you need help with crew members ever, uh, give me a shout. Uh, you, you, yeah. I, you should hook, we should hook up on WhatsApp so we yeah. can even talk. And, and we can do this, but yeah, anyway, yeah. but um, I can help with crew members that would do it and tell good that stories. That would be great. That, that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. I just want to thank Dark Hour uh, for coming yeah, in thank you. and nice fielding you. all those technical things uh, yeah. in the background. And, and follow up with any questions, you know, if you want to, even in the email or whatever, and um, I'll answer them. I don't mind. I'm sure all. I'll have more. I might even, uh, I know Tim Thomason wants to come back on the, show i might get you back yeah. on with him yeah uh, yeah that could be it, fun to have two of you together um, it could be it could be fun i mean like, I, yeah, I think he's already he saying but then he's back briefly but yeah he'll he'll tell good first unit stories with that director oh, <laughs> Ted Kacha. Woo. all right well listen uh, thanks all to everybody right. in the chat for uh contributing questions and comments yeah really appreciate I, it we've had a great nice yeah. consistent number of people watching i'm sure this is going to get viewed by a lot okay. of people so do okay. subscribe to the channel. I've just hit 3,000. I really appreciate that. I've got another interview tomorrow, can you believe? Oh, At 7 o'clock, I'm man. interviewing a young up-and-coming director who's just done their first feature film. It's called Blank. Um, so so yeah, 7 p.m. London time? 7 p.m. London time. I'm okay. doing a – it'll be quite All a right. short interview, probably about an hour, hour maybe right. an that's, hour and a half. That's 1 o'clock New Orleans Central time. Yeah. But I like, to, uh, I like to support <laughs> up-and-coming – directors yeah. i heard they had the film coming out and i said do you want to come on and talk about it yeah it's like an episode of black mirror kind of a, a weird sci-fi okay. uh, movie but it it's a really good really good first feature so um she okay. sent me a link to watch it i really enjoyed it so that's going to be fun and then next week i'm talking to emmanuel uh Sogwe about the uh, british urban film festival he's the founder it's one of the best film festivals oh. in the yeah. uk yeah so uh i've got a few things lined up uh, excellent well, we're you gonna have to wrap it up there because i've got to yeah. go well so, thank you um, very much and not even time for russ to plug his stuff but that's all right oh. we'll come back and do that another time uh, okay. do check out dark hours channel as well uh okay. you know you can find him on all the usual places and, and everywhere <laughs> and if you want if you need to do a, a deep dive on any film you know uh ask me and i'll do it and i'll get oh yeah the, well i, I, I will pick you up on I'll ask others other crew members to do it too because they'll they'll remember stuff i've forgotten that'd be great that'd be absolutely All great right. we'll, thank we'll, you we'll gentlemen definitely, we'll definitely do that thanks for doing this i appreciate it no problem thank you All okay guys, we're off we're off the